I was camping with my family and friends up in the mountains, sharing a tent with my older brother Luke and another friend called Evan. We weren't tired, and everyone retreated to their tents for the night. But the fire was dimming, and we were bored, so we went inside our tent to watch Adventure Time on my laptop. We all passed out after a few episodes, and I woke up sometime during the night into an episode of sleep paralysis. I have weird sleep habits, and experience sleep paralysis every few months or so. So for those of you who haven't had it, basically, you're awake but you can't move, and sometimes experience auditory and visual hallucinations. I was aware of this, so I didn't have a full-on heart attack when I started hearing shuffling noises outside my tent, which continued and got louder and closer until the fabric of the tent itself was being touched by something. My computer hadn't died yet, and I could see my surroundings in the dim light off the screen. I watched the fabric compress as something pushed against it sporadically about four feet off the ground, then moved around the tent towards me. I watched three distinct impressions follow this creature around the side of the tent. It looked like a claw. I was terrified and filled with adrenaline, but another part of me remained calm, assuring my body it was all a dream. I couldn't do anything, so my fear was pointless, but I continued to observe it and my sleep paralysis began to fade, and I realized I could move. No longer so was I convinced I was dreaming. I reached over and shoved Luke awake. I tried to get him to look, to see if there was really something out there. But I must have sounded like I was sleep talking because he just rolled over and went back to sleep, waving me off. Eventually the rustling stopped, and I was tired and groggy enough that I fell back asleep. In the morning I'd completely forgotten about it. That's until my brother-in-law said to us, It's a good thing we put the dog in the car last night. There was a bear here, whilst we were sleeping. Dean pointed out the tree where we'd strung up our trash, and saw the fresh, gaping claw marks about nine feet deep up the trunk. That hit me hard. I had seen the bear, and calmly watched it test the fabric of my tent twelve inches from my face. I went camping with the summer program when I was sixteen. Twelve other guys being managed by four adult men, and we were having a great time. S'mores, hot cocoa, campfire stories, the works. We all had to be in our tents, and either sleeping or awake, but quiet, by eleven. I was in a tent with two other guys, staying up later and just talking typical teenage guy stuff. As one guy is talking, I start to hear heavy breathing nearby, like someone has just been running and is out of breath. I ignore it and keep listening. I figure I'm just a weird kid hearing things, or that one of the guys in the next tent is making the noise whilst he sleeps. Then we hear, please help me, from outside. It didn't sound like anyone in the group. It sounded like an old man out of breath. We all went dead quiet and listened to this guy's breath, then asked again with a whimper at the end. I don't know what possessed this guy near the front of our tent, but he turned on a flashlight and opened the inner flap, but kept the outer zipped and looked out. We just see a pair of bare, old and scabbed pale legs standing there. It looked like this guy had been walking nude through the woods for some time. He asked for help and kept standing there. We were all paralysed with fear. But the guy at the front managed to say, Keep walking down the trail. A ranger will be there soon. The guy stopped breathing and said, No, no rangers. They keep me here. 
It was at this point someone else finally spoke up. A chaperone came out of his tent with a flashlight and cautiously asked him how long he'd been there and what happened to him. The old man didn't answer, just started sobbing and ran off into the woods. We saw by the flashlight that he was completely naked and emaciated. This was maybe seven or eight years ago, when I was 20, and in a really bad way. I had been screwing up my life via heroin for the past year. But after a lot of help, love and luck from friends and family, finally, I was getting my head cleared. I was almost there, above the black tar hell I had gotten myself into. I decided to get out of the city and drove two hours out to a smaller town in Missouri where Google Maps told me a small campsite by water was. I knew that there shouldn't be very many campers because it had just gotten cold and was around 40 or so that night. Nearly there as I'm driving down a misty morning road, just a picturesque straight two line highway. There's this object laying in the road about half a mile up. I slow my approach and can see this shaggy mutt just hanging out. I stop and roll down my window right next to it. And she came up, licked my hand and wagged her tail a bit. She seemed to expect something of me. She had no tag, no tattoo for Chip, and was just a dog with no name. Naturally, I popped open the passenger side door for her, and she was so glad and hopped in. So now I've got this dirty but friendly companion with me for my little excursion, the dog with no name. The entrance to the campsite was only a half mile further. As I suspected there was no one around, I just dropped a five in the honor box and picked the closest site to the stream. I set up my tent the same one I did set up for years with my dad as a kid, collected some dry sticks and started a fire. The dog with no name just circled the campsite, looking content enough to sniff some leaves and roll around in the mud. I went to check out the rivulet, about 30 feet wide. It had a man-made stone dam that you could walk across. To the west was the deeper part of the river, sort of pooling at the dam then maybe an eight-foot drop to the east into Karma streams. Instantly, I wanted to go on, cleanse myself, symbolize, baptize, whatever. I grew up Catholic, so that kind of shit runs through my head to this day, though I'm far from religious. The dog sees me scoping out the whole time from the campsite. I can't bring myself to do it though. I'm hugely disappointed in myself. But it's cold, it's brackish, and I don't have a towel. So I go back up to smoke some cigarettes, eat hot dogs, and pet the dog with no name. Night falls quickly after all this meditation, and I roll inside the tent to sleep. My buddy sleeps inside the tent, next to the sleeping bag. This dog was awesome. And I wake up in the middle of the night for no reason. I can't put my finger on it. And my main source of warmth the dog with no name, is missing. I slide out the tent, as I assume I left it unzipped, and there she is, just sitting there waiting for me in the pitch black, wagging her tail. I feel very strange, like something is happening here, and someone slash something is telling me to get back down to the river and do the damn thing. We walk down the short trail together, surrounded by Missouri black. It's even colder than before, but I start to strip anyway, standing on the chilly stones of the dam. The dog with no name sits on the edge of the river again, just watching me, a slight wag. I'm now stark naked as can be, staring into this black pool that looks like supernatural ink. I should mention here that I hate swimming in the water, I can't see the bottom of it, and my fearful imagination takes over and I freak out. In other words, I stand naked on the dam for over 10 minutes, 
before I finally mustered up the balls and just dive into the blackness. It was cold as hell and scary as shit. When I came up for air, I was thrashing wildly back towards the dam, scrambling back onto the slick stones. I shook up my hair and was surprised how the adrenaline helped me keep warm. As I was picking up my shoes and clothes, I looked over for my buddy at the river's edge. The dog with no name was nowhere in sight, back up the campsite. I look around gently whistling and that kind of thing. I'm more than woken up by now, so I go ahead and start another fire as dawn is just starting to break. I have another hot dog for breakfast and figure I might as well pack up and leave. This trip feels more than complete. I start my car up and check my phone. There is an hour time difference between the two. This happens to fall on daylight savings time. I'm not calling it a supernatural rip in time, but it's funny it was the night this went down. In fact, the exact time would have been around 3 or 4 a.m. that the dog disappeared. So the dog never showed up again, and I never shot heroin again. Whilst prospecting out here in the Caribou region, I came across a set of rock piles, known as Chinese piles, out in the middle of nowhere. These being here, means someone did a lot of digging back in the old days. So I started working, and after an hour and a half had about 10 grams of gold, and was having a happy dance, when I noticed the small standing stones on each of the rock walls. Each stone had several Chinese characters on them, and in a moment of dread, I realized that they were graves. I put the gold in a glass bottle I found nearby and left it behind. I also took down drawings of the symbols to show to a local historian, who later confirmed my suspicions that yes, they were graves, and they likely hadn't been seen in over 150 years. Chinese miners believe that if a miner died on sight, the ground became cursed by the fallen miner's spirit, so they wouldn't continue to mine the area and they would tell anyone who they met in the area that it had been worked out. Sometimes they would do extra work to make it look like the site was finished off, so people wouldn't end up digging up their comrades. I've been back several times, but I won't dig there out of respect. The site's super creepy in the morning fog. You can almost see people's outlines sitting around the piles. One of the stories my boss out here told me involved some sketchy folk from Prince George back in the 70s and went with them looking for some mining gear to steal so they could claim jump a site a few kilometers down the road. My boss went down this forgotten path into a clearing with two ancient bulldozers and a small cabin. The rest went to the bulldozers to see if they ran whilst my boss went into the cabin and was greeted by a skeleton laying in bed with a bullet hole in his head. They brought in the cops, and they figured the guy had been there since 1935, since that was the last date on the papers inside. I went to the same cabin with him a few weeks back, but the place had been burnt down by quad bikers. So, as a kid I lived about 100 miles away from the nearest town at a house without electricity or running water, which is the works in the Colorado Rockies. This place was in the absolute middle of nowhere, and we frequently sought all kinds of wild animals, ranging from elk, deer, coyotes, and cats. Our property and a bunch of other neighbors' properties bordered national forest roads, so to keep people off our road, we had to gate about a mile and a half from our house that we drove through before we reached our house. This time of year, we are the only people up there, as all the other homes are hunting cabins, long empty by this time in late winter. Now, this was not the type of gate that you could drive around if you forgot your key. There were tons of trees all around it, with barbed wire, ditches and such 
so anyone wanting for off-road around it would basically have to build a new road around this gate. Well, one night, my mother, brother and sister and I pull up to the gate and we cannot find the key. It's gone. So one of us, i.e. me, has to walk all the way back up to the house in the pitch black to fetch the spare key and make their way back down. Now, it's recently snowed in January and it is totally dark. You can't even see your hands in front of you dark. And with the new snow, you can't hear anything either. There are a few clouds in the sky on and off to let some starlight through every once in a while. But it's dark. And of course, there isn't a flashlight either. So off I go. First, you walk through around 200 meters of trees. Then it opens up to a huge meadow, which then narrows back down again to trees for another 200 meters, and then opens up again into another huge meadow, which on the other side of is our house. I set out and everything seems fine. I'm just irritated that I have to do this. I'm about 15 years old at the time and a little angsty teen that is peeved off at the slightest chore. I was not thinking about my surroundings in the slightest, but as I'm walking, I get that feeling that I'm being watched as I'm halfway through the first meadow. That deep, creepy dread that something is right behind you and you can't see what it is made it a thousand times worse by the lack of light and lack of being able to hear. My first instinct was to run, but I knew that if there was something, I was just going to provoke it. So I kept going and then stopped to try and listen as I heard a crunch echoing my footsteps. Holy shit. This time I walked a little faster and I knew there was something behind me. It was probably a cat as well. So I just kept walking right into the second bunch of trees before it opened up into a meadow. I could see our house. I could feel the pressure. At this point, we were predator and prey and I could feel the breath on my shoes. So second clearing comes up and I know what the plan is and I am about to book it. Thankfully, I'm familiar with what to do and I scream as loud as I can. As I do so, my dogs hear me and they run to chase whatever it is from behind me. They continue running past me and I book it into the house. When I get in, I grab the 12 gauge first and the key second, then pick up the tractor keys and jump in. There was no way I was going to walk that again. As I'm driving back towards the gate, I see the dogs running back. At least they weren't hurt. That could have been extremely dangerous. I also see the tracks. I knew it was a cat. It actually started approaching me from the first meadow and was tailing me for a long time. I tell my family the whole story and I know that I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. From that day, I refuse to be out alone at night in the countryside without a weapon. I was camping on land associated with the Anasazi, long dead Pueblo Indians that very few people know anything about. This was when I was a boy scout. We hiked for a few days and we saw black bears every day. It's normally a somewhat unusual sight and freaked out the adult leaders and caused us to religiously use anti-bear tactics like bear bags. Not totally related to the story, but it slowed us down, which led us to the events here. Anyway, we camped in a wood cabin at the bottom of a plateau, and the local rangers told us a bunch of spooky camp stories about the plateau and its relation to the long dead Anasazi people. Even their real names is lost to history, as Anasazi is what the Navajo called them, meaning ancient enemies or those who are not us. Another part of what they told us that stands out is that the Anasazi were obsessed with ravens 
and possibly crows as well. And a lot of their superstition revolved around massive raven people and people with raven heads, stuff like that. I completely forget all the other details at this point, as it was well over a decade ago. Anyway, my tentmate is a bit slow and is also very allergic to peanuts. He ends up eating some of the prepackaged food that contains a copious amount. That combined with the ongoing poor planning, fear of bears and sloppy leadership causes the adults to decide to camp out on the plateau rather than keep going. On this scout ranch, you're only supposed to camp outside the designated areas and never on the particular plateau, just because of the geography and the environment. But forget the rules, because we do anyway. We set up camp, eat, lay the bear bag and head off to sleep. That night though, was the craziest thing. I could hear so much thunder and so could my tent mate, but absolutely no rain, like insanely loud. My tent mate and I were terrified. It could have been heat lining, but it sounded impossibly close. We're terrified. He, the braver one of the two, actually goes out to check. As he opens the flap, I see the forest behind him. He comes back a few minutes later, and the thunder pretty much stops at the same time. He looks at me, and goes to bed without saying anything at all. It's not unusual in itself. He could be pretty slow and non-social, and likely had mild autism in hindsight. But the next day, we wake up and a ton of things popped red flags. Firstly, our tent is facing an open field, which is very strange because yesterday we both saw Forrest from when he left the tent to check. Second, no one else heard lightning that night, except for us, which was absolutely crazy as it was loud enough to wake everyone on earth. Remember how my tent mate checked out the thunder as well? Well, he had no recollection of what he saw. He woke up confused saying that the last thing that he remembered was just stepping outside. The good part though, the guy in the tent next door brought this up before we did. He also decided to get up and check it out and he claims that when he stepped out of the tent, there were no trees anywhere. Just extremely long, tall pole objects, almost as if there were thousands of stilts. When he looked up, he also said that there was no lightning visible, but it was super bright, full moon on steroids bright. He also claimed that he had seen flying, winged, pitch black objects, bigger than cars, and they looked like they had wings on them and that they were round. He dove back inside and doesn't remember going to sleep or the noise going away. Remember the giant raven myths? I did, and I was scared shitless. I wouldn't have believed him if I hadn't have seen the trees and heard the thunder for myself. About 10 years ago, I was working as a private investigator. It sounds cool, but it actually isn't. You spend about three to five hours each day driving to your cases stake them out in a blazing hot car with the engine off for eight hours and then spend one to three hours in a hotel room writing up your reports before finally getting some sleep and doing it all over again. I did this job for about a year after completing my training to be a medic in the army reserves. I was young at the time so the idea of making 50k a year and travelling all over the country whilst living out of a suitcase seemed appealing to 19 year old me. As I said before, you spend a lot of time driving around in areas you're not necessarily familiar with. On one of those late nights, I found myself driving onto a twisting mountain road just outside of Taos, New Mexico. The area was heavily wooded with narrow roads that curved sharply without a lot of places to turn off since you were driving up and around mountains and forests. 
in the middle of the night, as I maneuvered my rental vehicle through a curve, I saw a woman stumbling along the side of the road carrying a small child. The sight caught me off guard and sent a shiver down my spine. It was so unexpected and so out of place. There were no houses nor buildings around me and it was around 2am and pitch black. This unnerved me, but what sent the shiver down my spine was the way she moved. She lurched along with what I can only describe as a shuffle, straight out of a George Romero zombie flick, and she didn't look up or acknowledge me as I drove by. She just stared aimlessly at the road in front of her. You have to remember that I was 19 years old, and fresh out of a year of extensive army training. I was in peak physical shape, and I thought I was Billy Badass at the time. I had spent a month working in trauma centres as part of my training, so I still don't often get freaked out or scared, but seeing this did scare me. I drove on for a minute or two thinking about what I'd just seen. Who was she? What was she doing here this time of night? How did she get here? The more rational part of my brain took over, and I came to a horrifying realisation. I had been driving for about a mile and a half past her, and I hadn't seen any homes nor businesses, nor had I come across any places to turn off since I had seen her. And it had been about 10 miles since I had come across a place to turn before I saw her. This wasn't normal. Something was wrong. I realised that she had to be hurt or in trouble. Perhaps she'd been in a car accident and was in shock. What if the child she was carrying was hurt? I was a medic. I had trained for a year to help people. Sure, I was scared and unnerved. But how would I feel if they later died of exposure out on the mountain and I was too much of a coward to go back and help? Wouldn't I also be scared the first time I saw combat, when my friends were depending on me? I had to man up and turn around. And as soon as it was safe, I did so. I drove back to where I'd seen her, half relieved and half horrified when I could not find her. I traced the road a half a dozen times. Where could she have gone? There was only a small area on the side of the road and guardrails for miles. I drove, turned around and drove, and turned around and drove, and turned around and drove again. I was obsessed with finding her. Part of it was out of concern for her child. Part of it was proving myself that I was doing the right thing, even though I was scared shitless. After a while, however, it became about me proving it to myself that I wasn't actually going insane. I spent hours looking for her. Eventually I stopped my car and started walking along the road, looking for any signs of her or any disturbance on the mountain, to indicate that a vehicle had crashed off the road and down a mountain. I walked that entire three mile stretch of road in pitch black with a flashlight, at times yelling like a madman, listening to every twig and echo with bated breath. I didn't even care about my deadline or my next case, I was sure of what I saw. I wasn't crazy, I wasn't seeing things, and I wasn't overly tired. I saw her stumbling down that road, and there's no doubt in my mind. But there was nothing. Even when the sun came up and I drove to the stretch of road again half a dozen times, there was nothing. And there was no way for me to explain it, even after countless sleepless nights in the ten years since devoted to it. I don't believe in ghosts. I saw this bullshit documentary and laugh away their evidence and stupid orbs like the rest of you do. But I also don't know where the hell the stumbling woman and her child came from, or where they went. So, on the off chance that you were stumbling down a windy road in Taos, New Mexico about 10 years ago with a toddler in your arms, please, tell me what happened, where you came from, where you went, and that you were both okay. I've been puzzled for a decade now.
I used to regularly walk portions of the Appalachian Trail, and usually take a week or two by myself. Anyway, at one point I was coming over a pass and saw a figure on the trail ahead. It seems to be a lone young woman. It's twilight and the moon will be bright. I have solar rechargeable lamps, and I yell ahead, Ahoy! She doesn't break stride or pause. Being on the trail, people are friendly and cooperative. Looks like she's had a bad day, and no tent. Now sure, I like to sleep under the stars, and I usually hike with a hammock and a rainfly, but something seemed off. We were way, way out here. The last trail shelter was a few miles back, and we were on a very heavy bush cliff. Nowhere you want to camp for the night. I figure she might be wary of strangers at night, so I keep my own pace and don't really pay much more attention to her until she disappears over the next pass and I realise she's walking this trail. Now dark, with some moonlight but heavy tree cover, without a torch, lamp or any personal light source, I'm getting worried about this girl. Remember, we are walking with a sheer cliff face a few yards away from us and conditions aren't perfect. Roots, dirt, mud, moss, rocks, anything can trip you up. So I pick up pace and hurry over to the pass. She's nowhere, and there's a clear line of sight probably 200 yards ahead, and she's nowhere to be seen. But then I see a torch in the distance, red lamp. Actually, there's two now that I'm getting closer. I flash my torch, and they flash theirs. I call ahoy and a man and woman respond. We finally meet up and do the whole meet and greet exchange trail names and chat for a bit about what's ahead in our paths, since we were walking opposite directions. I say to the girl, you worried me back there. I saw you walking without a light and then you disappeared over the pass. I'm sorry I spooked you. Didn't think you were that far off though. Must have run like crazy to cover as much ground. She looked confused. What are you talking about? I explained everything, and she said that she hadn't seen anyone on the trail for at least three miles. There was no one reported missing, no abandoned campsites, nothing. I followed up with state police and rangers, nothing. Who the hell was on the trail ahead of me, walking at night with no light, minimal gear, and then to just suddenly disappear when there's only one way to go along the trail? I'm still clueless. I used to work security, and several years ago I was assigned to a remote construction site where a summer camp was being built. It was quite literally in the middle of the woods, roughly four or five miles into the forest with only a single access road that they'd been using to haul equipment and supplies and such. My job was to provide overnight security, doing a foot patrol of the entire area. The patrol covered around two miles, roughly once every hour, and then going back to my post, which was a tiny wooden shack not much bigger than a payphone booth to fill out my logs. Other than the occasional black bear, coyote or bobcat, it was a very boring assignment, with one exception. I was doing a routine patrol one night near the end of my shift, around 3am or so. I just passed the gate, where the access road enters the site, when I heard an extremely loud piercing scream that seemed to have come from a distance down the road. It sounded like a woman screaming in absolute terror, and at this point I need to clarify. I hear bobcats pretty often around my house, and encounter them occasionally whilst working in remote areas. They definitely have a distinctive and creepy scream, but there is absolutely no way that this scream was a bobcat. I immediately took off sprinting as fast I could in that direction. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, but about a quarter of a mile down or so, I came upon a car parked just off the side of the road. There was no car in sight when I'd come through on my way to my shift, so it had to have been parked there fairly recently, not running and with no lights on, 
and no doors opened nor anything. I called out to see if anyone was there, but got no reply. I looked around the general area and didn't see anything. Needless to say, I was pretty goddamn sketched out at this point. I ran back to my post and reported what I'd seen to the local police, since there wasn't really anything else I could do. Unfortunately, nothing ever came of it. I've never found out whose scream I heard or what caused it. The car was apparently owned by a guy who lived in the area, but I never heard why he was there. My supervisor suggested that maybe I'd heard a mountain lion or another animal screaming, but I've heard those animal sounds before, and although they're definitely freaky, there's no mistaking an honest to god human scream. A friend of mine and I were hiking through the woods. It was dark out, and we were beginning to head back towards home, when something came across the path by a fallen tree. It's hard to describe, but it looked like a man in a hooded cloak. It stood, and then slowly and silently moved to a tree and keeled. We couldn't see its face, but we got the feeling that we were being watched. We tried to shrug it off and keep moving. Further down the trail, we saw it again. Being in our early teens, we decided stupidly that we were going to get to the bottom of this. So we started after it, and it started charging. We screamed and it stopped, and then took off into the woods. Feeling brave again, I grabbed a big spear-shaped stick and took off after it. I ran for a bit through the woods until I could see the outline of it once more up ahead through the moonlight. I knelt and watched as another popped up beside it, then another, and then I heard moving to the side of me, realising that whatever these things were, they had surrounded me. I quickly noped out of there in the direction I left my friend, so I know that sounds like the creepy part, but it gets weirder. My friend wasn't there when I'd left him. So I called out to him, and he responded a little away, followed by... You've got to see this. So I followed his voice and came to a clearing. It was bright as hell. And floating around the clearing were legit balls of light. Almost like the fairy fountains from the Legend of Zelda. These were pure white light. And we looked at each other. And then hightailed it back to the trail and went home. It was definitely the strangest and scariest thing I've ever witnessed. I grew up in a very rural area of the Deep South, and spent most of my time riding horses alone in national forests and expensive private properties that bordered our house. There was an old abandoned house, two miles ride through the woods from me. I often rode by it on my journeys through the woods. Sometimes I tied my horse up, went inside and explored, but there was nothing really of interest. There was just trash, and things that looked like electricity bills from the 80s. I think an old woman used to live there based on some pictures that I found. Time went on, and I went away to college, taking my horse with me. I no longer rode past this abandoned house after graduating my college, and my horse and I moved back home for a little while and I decided to go back to explore the area again. So I rode my horse the two miles through the deep woods to get to this house, which itself is probably a thousand feet from a lonely gravel road that cuts through the forest. It is very secluded and almost creepy. The house is about three miles away from a paved road. I am less brave than I used to be, so when I entered the house I felt out of place and slightly scared but I used my cell phone light to explore the rooms anyway. A lot was just as I remembered, but right as I was about to leave, I found half a skeletal calf in the corner of the entry room. I have no idea how the calf got shut inside a building. The doors were firmly shut when I approached it, and also the screen door opened one way, 
so it was impossible for both to be open at once, for some creature to accidentally wander in. Furthermore, the nearest cow pastures were a good bit away from the house. I left the abandoned house with the image of my head of some deviant, cruelly trapping a calf in there for sick purposes. I hope I never have to meet the sickos who did that. It's felt like years. Allow me to explain. It was a vivid summer day, and I had taken a short notice trip to Arizona, trying to find some relief from the tiresome sunshine state on the other side of the nation. I only decided to leave when I was hit with a rather heavy day at work. My boss decided to chew me out for running late, despite the massive car crash on the motorway. A customer yelled at me because they didn't know what a Gmail was. Yeah, because I can definitely control traffic. And yeah, I definitely want to explain to you what Gmail is. I hate working customer service. So I called in sick and caught a last minute flight to Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. Nice and far away from the hell I called home. I wish. I'd never decided to do that. Around two days into my trip, I decided to head up to Zion Canyon for some sightseeing. I had spent a lot of time around the Grand Canyon and figured I should set some time apart to check out other places in the area. Besides, I'd never been to Utah before. Maybe I would take a hike, that one trail I had already read upon. Angel's Landing looked dangerous, but it would be something incredible to experience, and certainly worth it if I made the summit. I turned on Google Maps, and my rather shitty Android fumbled around with it, until finally it picked up the location. The voice of a robotic woman began to speak. It was the damn GPS lady. She guided me through several backwater roads with twists and turns and roundabouts, until she stopped with a final sentence. Head on Highway 89. Continue straight for 184 miles. All right, seemed easy enough. As I finally approached the highway, I was absolutely in awe by the view. No more buildings remained only the wild barren landscape of the southwest. Mountains peaked in the distance, covered by desert shrubs. Old trailers and abandoned houses dotted the landscape. Everything was so beautiful compared to the constant headache that was Florida. My eyes soaked up the desert views, relieved that for once it wasn't just endless miles of swampland. I felt so isolated. I was free from civilization for miles. But something was wrong. The desert didn't feel real to me. The sun was too bright, the mountains too still, and the sky too blue. The whole landscape seemed too picturesque, as if it were straight out of a postcard. It felt as though it were all a facade to drag me into something, and it was not unlike something straight out of a fever dream. You know those mornings as a kid where you wake up with a pounding headache and sense of false reality? I'd been driving for hours, and the scenery just seemed to remain stagnant. I was so sure I'd spent the entire damn day on the road, but the sun hadn't moved an inch. Was I hallucinating? God, when was this road ever going to end? Speaking of it, I'm still here. I've been driving on this road every day. It only keeps on going and going. I've been seeing the same road signs over and over. There's no civilization around. I've tried knocking on those trailer doors, but no one's ever home. And you know what else? Despite my solitude, I feel like I'm constantly being chased. I hate that feeling. That same feeling from when you're a kid and you sprint up the stairs from the pinch of darkness down, not daring to look back at whatever was behind you. 
That feeling when any source of noise of your house was enough to make you jump and run for your life. The source of the noise for me was the booming. And that feeling is always here. Every once in a while I hear a booming, as if someone is going at it with a gigantic drum. I slow my car down, and the booming gets faster, closer and louder. And that feeling, every time I slow, the feeling grows stronger, as if it whatever it was is getting closer. It's like whatever that something is is hunting me down, almost testing me, and every time I stop the booming gets louder, as if it's targeting me. I don't know what that is, but I feel like it's dangerous. I don't know what chases behind me. But I know better than the kid who runs away from his basement door the first chance he gets. Running away from that something, but that something is behind me. I don't know what it is, but it's got me trapped right where it wants me to be, and I can't get out. I've driven off cliffs and into rivers, yet I wake up on the side of the road again, to the same sight, my truck waiting for me to drive off again. I can't even commit suicide. The place won't let me. I've tried communicating through whatever internet I could scrounge up on my phone, but I don't even know if anyone has seen my cries for help. The screen just shows up blank, save for my own words written in desperation. No one will ever answer my texts. No one will answer my calls. I will never see any other cars. Only me. I never get hungry or tired or thirsty, only trapped. It's like time hasn't passed. Time hasn't passed. Everyone is gone. Something's chasing me and I'm still writing this. I think I've been in the same spot for too long. The boom's only getting louder and now something is right behind me. Time has not passed and I need to get out. Now. Tonight, my sister, brother-in-law and two friends and I all piled into a truck and we headed out to the desert near the old Cal Portland concrete factory. About half hour into driving, kicking up dust and messing around, everyone gets the chills and my anxiety starts to flare up. We brush it off as the temperature difference and just keep going. Ten minutes later, we come around a corner and my sister says, Please tell me you guys just saw that woman. We responded with, What woman? She says, We just passed a woman standing on the side of the road wearing pink. I think it was a pink shirt. And she had blonde hair that was covering her face. She looked dead. I honestly thought she was messing with me, so we turn around and go to the spot where she saw her. No woman. Brother-in-law and I get our flashlights out and look around. No woman. I tell my sister she's seeing things, and she insists that she saw a woman. So I decide to check my dashcam footage. Sure as shit, there was a woman. She was crossing the road, it looks like and she just vanishes into thin air. My camera isn't of the best quality by any means, and it was quite dark, but it's clear what we saw. My brother-in-law and I canvassed a two mile square radius with flashlights calling out to the woman because we legitimately thought that someone was lost out in the desert. The entire time we kept feeling and hearing things around us some info to note, this was right next to an extremely murky pond. There is a possibility that her body could be hidden in the pond. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in the Pacific Northwest between San Francisco and Portland. We had rented a car and were stopping at different campsites every night on our way from the former to the latter. 
The first night we arrive at a campsite, we find that it had been closed for the season, despite the fact that we looked on their website and they say that they were open. So we ended up driving around, looking for another campsite on Google Maps. But at this point, it's getting dark. We see a forest firefighter outpost and pull in to ask them if they know of any nearby. They tell us that most of them are closed for the season, but there are a couple on their old map that we haven't checked. We get back on the road and find our way to one of these campsites. The sign for this place is literally resting on the ground and is a little overgrown. But at this point it's dark as hell and we really don't have many other options. As we pull our car in to what we think is a spot, we see a few other tents nearby, so we take it as a good sign. We get out and start to set up our things, when immediately, things begin to get strange. Two guys walk directly through our spot and strike up a conversation with us. Both are looking a little rough. One of them has a zip up hoodie without a shirt underneath and I notice that he is extremely skinny. They're also both really dirty and have messed up hair, but hey, we're camping. They're both speaking very fast and seem kind of nervous. They tell us that they're actually seasonal workers nearby and are staying at this campsite to save money whilst they're there. Whilst we're talking to these two guys, a decade old white Mercedes pulls into the campsite with all four windows blasting rap music. The driver and passenger look like some real ICP enthusiasts. They look around quickly and leave immediately. At the time, I thought they were probably looking for a campsite too. The two rough dudes also leave and we continue setting up camp. Not too long after we get another visitor. This time it's an older woman with a three pack a day voice. She's nice enough, but also asking us some pretty weird questions. You guys here for the horror show, she asks. I'm thinking, what's a horror show? Do you mean the haunted house lady? She tells us that lots of people come out for the horror show and starts warning us about all the ghouls and zombies. She eventually leaves and my girlfriend and I agree they must be talking about some kind of haunted house nearby, as it was early October. And you know, maybe that's where the seasonal worker dudes who looked kind of scary happened to be working at. It all checked out in my mind. We start our fire, and I begin breaking out the wood, when my girlfriend admits that she's freaked out. She's worried about the people that we've encountered and how strange this campsite is. She points out that there aren't really any sounds coming from anyone else's tents, with the exception of the one woman who wouldn't stop coughing. No music, no children, laughter, nothing. I'm starting to believe her. But at this point it's pretty late and we don't really have any other options. I'm also thinking that if the campsite is weird, it's just some harmless weirdos. She seems pacified by my confidence and we continue making dinner. It's at this point a bunch of really weird shit starts happening. The two dudes we met right when we got there emerge from the woods without any source of light and without saying a word, walking straight into their tent. They have a very short and heated discussion which I can't make out. One of them storms out of the tent and walks straight towards the older woman's campsite making eye contact with me for an uncomfortably long amount of time. He then climbs into the cab of her pickup truck, and I realise there's already someone in there, and likely has been for some time, probably the woman. You can tell that they start smoking something from when the lighter flickers. This strikes me as especially odd. You smoke cigarettes in the car? Probably not. What? We're at a campsite in Northern California, 
and I'm pretty sure there aren't any kids around. Why go into the car to do that? Then it hits me like a sack of bricks. It's meth. They were all smoking meth, and the woman was probably dealing. The level of comfort she had established in her campsite indicated that she'd been there for a while. Meth explained why everyone was looking like emancipated zombies. It explained the juggalos driving through, getting spooked and leaving. It explained the strange erratic behavior and constant coughing from everyone. This was clearly some sort of live-in meth village at a closed down campsite in the backwoods of Northern California. It's at this moment that I realize the second guy is skulking around the edge of our campsite, clearly trying not to be seen. I conceded to my girlfriend that I also wanted to leave. We packed up everything very slowly and normally, trying to make it look like we were just putting away food and putting our fire out for the night. With only the tent left, I tell my girlfriend to get into the car and get ready to back out of the spot. The second I pick up the tent, the woman's truck starts up and her lights turn on. They were blindingly bright circular lights on a rack. I throw the tent into the trunk as fast as I can and I tell my girlfriend to back up. I'm standing behind the car to guide her but also making it very clear to whoever's watching us that I have a hatchet. I was so on edge that if Mr. Rogers caught me off guard, I would have buried that thing into his skull. She throws the car into reverse, hits the pedal and the car doesn't move. I can hear the engine revving and I see the car lurching, but it's not going anywhere. For a split second, I think they've slashed our tire somehow. This is how horror movies start. Suddenly it hits me. The parking brake is likely on. It was. She backs up, gets on the main path, and I jump in the passenger seat. As we drive out there, we can hear them start screaming about something. Once we get onto the main road, we do a Chinese fire drill. And I drive down the road at warp speed to the first bed and breakfast that we see. It was lovely. It was June 1987 because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in Southeast Idaho. It was a pretty big place with lots of acreage. The guy who was the full-time caretaker for the place had just quit. And my girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker. But the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered to pay me $1,200 to go out there Free food, satellite TV, and all I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never been out west, so I took him up on it, and it sounded better than doing landscaping. I spent the time reading, exploring, playing the dogs and riding the horse. It was completely uneventful, until that night. After the knocking stopped and dogs stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out that much because there were two German Shepherds inside with me and I had a gun. I kept it on my nightstand. I had been drinking a little but was not drunk by any means. There were several neighbours that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking that someone had just driven down the wrong driveway. Next morning at the crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was around a hundred yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone with that make or model of car. He said he didn't and he called the police directly. Police show up, ask me a few questions and walk around the property for an hour or so. The car was locked and the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broken down or not. There was only one set of tire tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up to say the guy who owned the car was missing and to call the police if anything weird happened again. 
I have no idea who the guy was at all. Don't know how long he was missing or when he was reported missing. Or who reported him missing. He was just missing. My girlfriend's dad didn't know much about it either. After about a month, I go back home. The girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. I see her out of town a few months later and ask her if she ever found out what happened to the guy. All she knows is that the guy was found dead, apparently killed himself 30 miles away. The suicide happened several months after that incident at the house, and he was found a couple of days after that he'd killed himself. I asked her how he did it, where he was found and who found him, and I got nothing, and I never saw her again. I am an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my early 20s living in the remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, Yukon and BC. I have many odd frightening and bizarre stories that came from my time in the north and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012, when I was 22, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in a provincial park on the Alaskan Highway, four hours north of Fort Nelson and two hours south of the Yukon slash British Columbia border. The best part about the park was the fact that it had a beautiful natural hot springs, which attracted tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place that had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service and no internet. And driving four hours to Fort Nelson every two weeks to get groceries and do my laundry, life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs and make some traveling friends and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground? Park facility operator, which was general maintenance and cleaning of campsites, as well as gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes I had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was so completely different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city that I'm from, there are people around, and you are aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are pretty quick to respond, and neighbors are also a big plus. However, in the woods, I felt very vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away, and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily be broken into. Not to mention it was pretty dark, which made it all the easier to sneak around at night. I was already on edge sleeping every night. The trailer next to mine was abandoned by the previous manager of the campground, after his son had shot himself in the head inside of it. The previous manager had promised numerous times he would hire a company to drive up from Fort Nelson and tow the trailer away, but that never happened. Not whilst I lived there at least, and nobody seemed to care about it too much. I went into the trailer once, saw the blood and brains were still on the wall, and never went back again. Back in the 90s, there was also a fatal bear attack at the hot springs. We all had to read the incredibly gruesome and detailed police report for our bear aware training. So yeah, unsettling to say the least. 
One night, at probably around two in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and am woken up by a very loud banging on the trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and I see a car with its lights on and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. This is the moment I've been scared of the entire summer. Through the door I say, how can I help you? And one of the guys clearly hammered out of his mind starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say, sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. And the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to speak to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell that they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a sober person enough to coherently tell me what is wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically, he says that him and his friend are on vacation and they came up from Fort Nelson to party. They had a really long drive, but were at the hot springs and they were having beers and they were sorry about having beers. They weren't drunk, clearly. And then he drops the bomb that someone is running around the camp, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and I notice that he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, yes, someone's running around stabbing everyone. Then the other guy yells, come on, let's go. And they hop into the aforementioned car and sped off before I got a chance to question them further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door in the darkness, alone, thinking that there's a maniac running outside wielding a knife. I have no phone and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger and his cabin is about a five minute walk away from my trailer. I remember at that point that I do have a radio, so I run inside my trailer, lock the door and try and get the ranger on the radio. Of course, his radio is switched off and the only thing I think I can do at this point is to go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I slip out of my trailer and run through the darkness across the maintenance ground, past the creepy suicide trailer and through a thicket straight towards the ranger's cabin. Every single noise I hear from the surrounding forest is making my heart pound faster. I keep imagining this maniacal man sneaking through the bushes, entering people's tents and slashing everybody like some bad horror film. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived, and I tell him the whole story. Whilst I'm there, he calls the police and he tells him that they are on their way and will be there in four hours. The ranger grabs his gun, walks me to the back of the trailer and says, don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me. The intense kind of listening, where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made, that you almost feel death from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze, my heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily and I'm thinking, this is it. A knife wielding maniac is going to murder me and this trailer is going to have to be another one which they will have to tow away. I'm just sitting there on my bed 
in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I am listening intently to the heavy breathing, and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is, and I peer out of the window, and I see a bison is scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. The RCMP get there around 6.30am, and proceed with their investigation for about 10 hours. They close off the springs and the entire campground turns into an episode of CSI. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night, until the investigation is over. Apparently, there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. Not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy, to tell me of course of the incident. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer. He was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friend stopped by my trailer to try and make it look like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. For many days following this incident, I was cleaning up blood soaked clothing and rags from all random places over the campground. So knife wielding maniac, let's not meet again. From 2012 to 2013, I did a lot of hiking in and around the coastal range of Oregon. I would frequently go out by myself for days, and coming to town to restock on food if necessary. It was commonplace for when I was in town to spend the whole day hiking back the four hours to where I was camping at dusk. The trail I took wasn't well travelled, and looked more like a deer path than anything. I had chosen my campsite for its lack of foot traffic, and its serenity avoiding conventional locations. I only had a cell phone on me during this period of hiking and camping, no bright clothing, and no GPS nor tracking device or emergency beacon, which probably wasn't the smartest idea looking back. There were times I heard and saw things whilst out in the forest, that I didn't recognise by sight, and or sound, but nothing came close to the incident that I had in May 2013. I had just done my usual restock, in this small town some six miles from where I had decided to camp for the night and I spent the day in town as usual. I started walking back to my camp location at about dusk. Half of the walk, I choose to use dirt roads, until veering off on the deer trails that I used earlier in the day. By this time, it was completely dark, but it was clear out, and possible to see the trail just using the moonlight. I don't listen to headphones whilst hiking, I've always thought it's wise to be able to hear what's around you in the event of there being a predator, whether that be man or animal alike. I was mentally doing some calculations for the next day's hike, when my mind is literally stopped mid-track. I hadn't heard anything, and I don't hardly make any sound when hiking. If I'd heard something, I would have known. For some reason, be it a sixth sense or survival instinct, I'm not sure, but I was jolted quite suddenly out of thought, and made very aware of the fact that I wasn't alone on this trail. What was odd to me, especially, is that even though I had heard nothing whatsoever, no light wind, no birds, I knew acutely that something was behind me about 30 yards down the trail. I still to this day have so many unanswered questions about how I knew this. Standing really still, 
I turn around and look down, but I don't see anything in the trail, but I feel it. It's honestly really difficult to pin down exactly how to describe what I felt, because I hadn't felt that way before or since. I was standing straight up, fight or flight, and my logical mind was saying that there's nothing out of the ordinary, whilst my senses were saying to get the hell out of there. Again, looking back, and remembering I have no idea what to say. It's really hard to express. It was like I was being taunted, and I felt it. The presence of something or someone was down there in that trail, and for some reason, I knew that it knew that I knew it was there, even though I couldn't see it. That's what scares me. I knew, and it was bright enough out for me to see 30 yards down the trail with no problem. There was nothing there, and I felt as if I were being called or beckoned to come closer. This was maybe 30 seconds into looking down the trail. I was panicking, but I still wasn't sure what to think because I wasn't seeing anything threatening. So I turned around and started walking at a quick pace. I don't know what else to do. I knew that if it was in fact a guy out to kill someone, he was probably going to end up killing me on this trail or in my tent after following me back. So why run? I would say it was not even a minute into the quick trek back that I heard what can only be described as a sound like rushing or swooping air, and then what seemed like a rake sliding across the dirt trail. The former sound happened right after the latter. These sounds happened together at about half a second a pass for four times. They were very close to me, maybe 20 yards back, and looking back, I don't know how I was able to stay composed and not soil myself, but somehow, I mentally stayed focused enough on getting myself back to my tent. I ignored the panic and just kept walking quickly, not looking back. Whoever or whatever it was that followed me, the majority of the next hour, I kept heading forwards and didn't look back. A few minutes from my camp location, the fight or flight instinct gradually but succinctly left and I crawled into my tent and didn't sleep a minute that entire night. Morning came and I picked up and left. I grew up on the countryside, right next to a national park, frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk or run. But 10 year old me felt that this was a stupid rule. And so I did anyway, because the trails were perfect for it. I knew fully well that I wasn't supposed to do that. I was caught a few times, but nothing much came of it, apart from a half-hearted, don't do it again. And of course I did. Until one day, something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders, and I would often take them on horse rides, usually into the Forbidden Park. This day, very early in the morning, the first day of summer holiday, it was beautiful outdoors, misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before 6am, I knew that there wouldn't be anyone on the trail to see me. So I set the horse off at full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got steep on one side, leading down to the river, because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much even for a kid with next to no non-existent risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to take another step. I grew up with horses all my life and knew that this usually indicates that you need to investigate. Is there something with the hooves? Did the horse spot something that spooked it? So I checked and the hooves were fine, but the horse didn't move an inch. 
and that's when I saw it. Someone had set a trap. A thin, sharp metal wire across the trail. In perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around, but didn't see anyone. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove, so I led the horse around it. And, to do so, I had to walk up a bit into the wooded area on the side of the trail. That's when I heard the singing. The song is called Hey Tonte Gubar, and it was that particular melody, but the lyrics were different and sung in a muffled, sniggering voice. Imagine Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. Today I only remember parts of it, but translated it would have been something like, Hey, all you runners come here passing, let the lifeblood pour out. I, as silently as I could and with my heart in my throat, backed away, and got up on the horse, and hurried back the way I came as fast as I could. I knew I had to tell someone about it, but at the same time wanted to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails. So now I had a problem. The old stories about a mad old man living in the shed in the woods, a shed that was once a cottage for a local hunter, came back as I hung on the horse for dear life. I got home and told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching, we also found a spear-like pole in the ground, right on the spot that you'd land after you came running and jumped over the fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. The area was searched and several similar traps were found, but no sight of the old man. The following summer though, there was big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found right under the water's surface, directly under the little tower you're supposed to dive from at the lake. And black garbage bags filled with big rocks were found on the narrow bridge crossing the river, so that if a car had hit it, there's a chance that it would have gone off the road and straight into the water. When I was about 10, me and my friend were walking on a road near the river when we spotted a tipped over canoe. Having been in the fairly shallow river many times before, I didn't think twice about stepping in to push the canoe up and out. But just as I leveraged, the ground seemed to disappear. I was sucked down into a pit and tumbled around like a rag doll only to be spit back out maybe 20 feet downstream, and sucked under again. This happened over and over, as my friend was running alongside trying to get a hold of me. Luckily, I was being shot to the surface often enough to get a little air before going under. He eventually reached me with a branch, and I was able to get out. We didn't make a second attempt on the canoe, and didn't tell anyone about the experience for fear of getting in trouble. But, a couple of days later, we learned that an elderly couple had just drowned upstream. Their canoe tipped over, and the undertow took care of the rest. I was nearly killed trying to get the same canoe that had just killed two people. I was about 13 years old, walking through a small section of pines back to my grandmother's house. It was a really dark and cloudy day, and was walking under the trees as it was very dim. As I walked, I saw a kid sitting underneath a tree ahead. This was a relatively rural outskirts of a small town, and there were only a few kids that lived around. I walked up to him to see who it was, as I didn't think I recognised him, so I stepped closer. He was a young boy, head down, gaunt and skinny. He was wearing burlap or wool pants, a ragged dress shirt, both very dirty and dingy. He had what looked like two little tin cam wagons or cars, and was pushing them around in the dirt. 
as I got closer, almost right in front of him. A feeling of absolute dread and sickness washed over me, and all of a sudden, I felt like I was going to throw up. Hey, I kind of stuttered. He looked straight up at me, and I froze like a stone, ice cold. In one quick move, he grabbed up his wagons and jumped to his feet, and circled around the back of the tree. It was quiet. I felt fine all of a sudden. I walked up to the tree, and he was gone. When I hiked alone frequently, I used to see flashes of colour out of the corner of my eyes. It happened often enough that I learned to pretty much ignore them. I dismissed most of them as birds, small animals, or my imagination. The ones that still caught my attention. Were the red or blue ones, and one time pink. The bright colours were more hard to rationalise away. Carbon Glacier in Mount Rainier National Park, June fifth, two thousand and one. I remember crossing the suspension bridge on my way to the Carbon Glacier, and it looked to be in very poor condition and was missing a couple of boards, forcing you to take a large step. The second missing board was right in the centre of the bridge, where you're furthest from the ground. My sister crossed first, and stopped about three quarters of the way across. She turned around slowly, looked back at me, and yelled for me to step on two slats at a time, as one just broke under her foot. I froze at the second missing board, and it took me several seconds to take that long step across the hole. We decided to use the lower crossing to avoid the suspension bridge. After these days, it was the only way to go since the trail on the other side of the river washed out. We were having a good day, talking and laughing and telling stories. My sister was in the middle of a story when a flash of white went past my peripheral vision on the left. I ignored it. But what I couldn't ignore was the fact that my sister had stopped talking. I turned to ask her what was wrong, and she was pale. She said someone was walking up the trail, and just disappeared as they approached me. She was visibly shaken and upset. I chose not to tell her about the flash of white, as I had seen it at the same time. We were both teary and shaking, and hiked out. Pretty quickly and very quietly. It took me several years before I spoke about it again. When I told my sister about the white flash, she couldn't remember any of it, as she completely blocked out that day. Two years later, in an effort to see the standing file account at Washington State, I was given permission from the Highline School District to hike on their property. To the old Stampede Pass lookout now at Camp Wozkowitz, in North Bend. The woman at the office told me that I should hike around the property after visiting the lookout. It was a beautiful sunny winter day. I hiked to the lookout, and then started down a different trail. The trail was fairly open, with a lot of salal. I heard a little girl laughing off in the distance. And assumed that someone else was enjoying the trails like me. Not a moment later, there was a flash of pink. I'd never seen pink before, and it gave me quite a fright. I looked into the woods and saw nothing. My stomach turned and my eyes teared up. I decided I'd had enough of Camp Wozkowitz, and quickly headed back to my car. I was babysitting in a very remote house in the middle of nowhere, up in the mountains on the coast. I remember it was around 9 p.m., and the kids' parents would be getting home in about an hour. I had put the kids to bed, so was downstairs by myself watching TV. However, every so often the TV would flicker to static, and to be honest, it was starting to scare the shit out of me. It wasn't until the point where I looked up from the TV, 
and out the nearby window when I lost my shit. There wasn't anything actually outside, but it seemed as if I saw in the reflection what looked like a tin man standing not too hard behind me from the couch. Needless to say, there wasn't actually anything there when I snapped my head back to see where it was in the reflection. I grabbed my shit and wanted to be out of that house as quickly as possible. I actually ran upstairs and sat down quietly where the kids were sleeping until the parents got home. I particularly remember that when the parents arrived, I said I had to leave and I was pulling out of their driveway in my old shitty Ford laser and looked up into the kids bedroom. The same reflection I saw earlier was looking back down at me, with a hand raised as if it were saying goodbye. I never babysat there again. At my grandparents on vacation to Iowa. They live in the middle of nowhere. Couple elderly neighbors and cornfields for miles. It was around 2am and I was going to go have a smoke before bed. Their back porch has a big sliding door. Well, I walk into the room with the sliding door and there's a guy in a creepy mask. He's quietly wiggling the door trying to open it. I got so scared, I felt my butthole clench up and I dropped my cigarette. Right then, the guy freezes and looks right at me. He pauses, then starts frantically shaking the door trying to open it. Like this dude was trying to rip the door off the house. I run over to my grandparents gun cabinet and grab something. By the time I whipped around to point it at him, he was gone. I ran and woke up my grandparents. We all walked around the house with loaded guns for a minute, but the guy was gone. A couple of weeks later, some bald guy walked out of a cornfield wearing a dress. He stood by the highway for half an hour, then got picked up by some sketchy car. I won't even go into cornfields in broad daylight anymore. This happened when I was 10. There were five or six of us spending the night at Charlie's house. Her parents owned a ranch in hill country region of Texas and their home was built on top of a hill. Other than the dirt driveway up to their house, the hill was wild land covered in cedar trees. It was a clear, slightly chilly night in maybe October or November. But after the sun went down, the moon was out, so we stayed out playing hide and seek using the driveway as a base. Their ranch was far enough out of town and well fenced so her parents didn't have a problem with it. Anyway, during one round of hide and seek, me and my friend Georgina were the last two hidden. We were very good at hiding and avoiding the seekers and they managed to find everyone else. Also we thought, we almost made it back to the road when three of the girls unknowingly cut us off and we ducked behind a ridge of dirt to remain concealed. Georgina threw a rock across the road behind them to divert their attention and we were waiting for them to get far enough off the road to make a dramatic rush for the safety of base when I heard what sounded like a rock getting dislodged and sliding down the hill behind us. I thought Georgina might have done it, so I didn't say anything, but she kind of looked at me and asked if I was okay. I was about to reply when we heard what sounded like one of our friends, Charlie, the ones whose house we were staying at, calling from away down the hill behind us. Help me. We bolted upright and yelled for the others. They came running back to the road and we told them what we had heard. No one had seen Charlie since we'd started that round of hide and seek. We took them to the spot where we were hidden and from there we called Charlie's name. For a moment, all was quiet. 
Then, faintly, even further down the hill, we heard her say, Help! I'm stuck! We panicked and ran up the driveway as fast as we could to get to Charlie's parents. When we burst through the kitchen door ready to yell for her mum and dad, she was there at the bar eating a popsicle. I wondered how long it was going to take for you all to find me, she gloated. We all flipped out, in the only way ten-year-old girls can. Her parents heard us freaking out downstairs and came down to see what's going on. We told them what happened, and her father grabbed his shotgun, got into the truck, and went to drive around the ranch making sure that there wasn't anyone on the property who wasn't supposed to be there. He didn't find anything. I've always wondered what we heard that night. We didn't talk about it much, but I know it remained in all our minds every time we stayed there past sundown. I live in a small town in rural Australia. I am a cyclist, and I coordinate sport events, marathons, and sell bike gear and whatnot. Around 6am, I drove my bike up the mountains and on the way, I passed a woman sitting by the side of the road. At first I thought she may have been a hitchhiker, but there were no hotels around and she had no bags. I stopped my car around 400 meters away from her, grabbed a bottle out of the car boot, and walked down to see what was going on. At that moment, I realized she's one of the most gorgeous women that I had ever seen. She was probably in her 20s, pale as hell, long wavy blonde hair to her hips, and one of those really German hourglass kind of figures, with these deep blue eyes. She was wearing one of those long summer dresses that beach kids seem to love, which was friggin weird for the middle of the Australian bush. So I walk up to her like, oh my god. But I'm also thinking, what the hell? I hand her the bottle of water and ask her if she's lost or needs a lift back to town. She just stares at me, doesn't take the water, and doesn't blink. I think, oh shit, is she some kind of crazy? So I ask her if she ran away from somewhere, and she just says, no, and hadn't blinked yet. So I ask her if she's waiting for someone to come pick her up and she says, no, again. I ask her where her house is, and she says, here. Keep in mind I am halfway up a mountain, and there are no houses here at all. So I was kind of starting to get creeped out by this lady. I walk back to my jeep, and I was going to start driving back down the mountain, and call the cops and get them to come pick up this lady. And she follows me. I was like, look, are you sure you don't want me to run you back to town? And she just says no again. So I'm all like, look, I don't feel comfortable leaving you here in the middle of nowhere. Please let me take you to the police station. And she just turns around and walks off into the bush, miles from anywhere. And I'm sitting there like, what the actual hell? And then I started to get really scared when the bug and bird noises started to come back. It made me realize I hadn't heard a single other sound whilst I was speaking to her. No magpies, no crickets, no early morning sounds at all. I hightailed it out of there and called the local coppers when I reached the bottom of the mountain. Basically I said there's a woman up in the mountain who refused to get into my car, and then realized how stupid that sounded, and hung up. Whoever you are, I hope that you were okay. I have had the fortune of traveling all across this great and wonderful nation. But I've seen something whilst camping that makes me reconsider mountain folk in Georgia. Now, I love my home state. I love exploring the vast amounts of wilderness we have here. I just happen to carry a gun at all times whilst exploring now. I didn't then. I went to the Blue Ridge Mountains with a friend to hike. 
a week without cell phones, we called it. Except we had his satellite phone, just in case of an emergency. We hike as far as we please, and fish, and we find water. Of course, we also have a GPS, and a compass to ensure that we don't get lost. So we're on our next to last day of hiking back. We come across a small clearing in a valley that has a nice sized pond. We stop to set up camp and fish. As night falls and our fire is fading, with our bellies full of fish, wild onion, potatoes and wine, we lay down to sleep. And then I hear it. My friend is fast asleep and the sound doesn't wake him. There's something outside. Close by, but not distant enough. A moment of stupidity and adrenaline hits me as I grab our machete and exit the tent brandishing my lackluster weapon. The sound of that of a drum is being played with skill and expertise that only a child with the basic idea of rhythm can possess. Upon exiting the tent, I see a fire and a woman across the pond. She's not creating the drum sound. Instead, she has a black kettle hoisted above her fire and she's stirring it. She turns her face to me and I see that she must be as old as the mountains themselves. Her clothes are nothing but rags, yet she has an aura about her, one that is dark and filled with terrible wisdom and knowledge. Her ancient eyes meet mine, and I become paralyzed by fear. The drumming grows louder, and then stops suddenly, and she's gone. So is the fire, and any evidence that she even existed. I started our fire again, and did not sleep. Upon hiking out of the woods and back into our car, we decided to stay at a hotel in a small town nearby, since I was exhausted from staying awake. Of course, I had told my tale to my friend when he woke, and we packed quickly, and moved as fast as our legs would carry us. We got to the hotel which, thankfully, had a restaurant and bar. I told my tale to some locals, and the consensus was that I had met the mountain witch, whose land I was trespassing on, and we were only alive because I had stayed awake. They may have been jesting, but they seemed very serious. I now carry a firearm whenever I hike, mostly because it makes me feel safer. And whether you believe my tale or not, makes no difference to me, dear listener. But there are dark and ancient things in this world. Stay safe. In the early 1980s, I was about eight years old, and my father decided to take me to deer camp for the first time. We were in far northern Wisconsin, where deer camp is sort of like a religion experience, especially our deer camp. Anyway, when we got there, my dad leaned in about three inches from my face and gave me a thinly veiled threat that he called a piece of advice. That what was done at camp stays at camp, and especially not to tell my mother what I was about to witness. It was mostly just a bunch of middle-aged drunks in long johns telling dirty jokes and playing cards. But to my eyes, it was the best place on earth. The first morning, my dad wakes me up early to go hunting with his best friend, who had cancer and wasn't expecting to make it back for next year. We were way back in the woods in a standoff when an unseasonal thunderstorm rolls in and chased us back to the truck. On our way back to camp, my father slams on the brakes because he sees something in the middle of the road. It was raining so hard that we couldn't tell 
what it was from inside. So my dad went to take a look. A couple of minutes later, he climbs back into the truck and simply says, she's dead. We raced for miles to the nearest phone to call the police. It turns out that she was heavily pregnant, had put her car in the ditch about five miles away and had died from exposure when she became lost looking for help. My main memory of this though, is bursting out crying on the way home because I just knew I couldn't keep this big of a secret from my mother. My dad simply told me that there were exceptions to every rule and this was definitely one of them. I was running on the trails at the Nathan Hale Homestead, an 18th century farmhouse and property of a Revolutionary War hero. This was in Connecticut, which is only about a 10 minute drive away from my grandmother's lake house. I could not find a map of the trails anywhere online, and there didn't seem to be any signage at this place just a bunch of random mountain bike trails in the woods. I was only going to run four miles, so I estimated that I would run for about 30 minutes, using my watch to keep myself on track. So I ran around the trails for a while, and nothing seemed too out of the ordinary. It was around nine on a Monday morning, and the only sounds were the distant hums of Route 31. Birds chirping and the occasional squirrel or deer that scampered off whenever I came near. The trail seemed to wind around a lot. If not for my better than average directional skills, I could have easily gotten lost. About 20 minutes in, I saw something strange about 50 meters off. A finely polished and light colored wooden coffin. I was a little weirded out to say the least and waited until I got closer for a better look. I rounded a corner where several old tree stumps blocked my view only to find that the coffin had disappeared. Where it should have been, there was just a clump of ferns. Odd. I turned around shortly thereafter and made my way back to my car. I was maybe half a mile out when I heard a very distinctive knocking on a nearby tree. I was a little spooked, but chalked it up to be a woodpecker or something. However, not 30 seconds later, there it was on a completely different tree ahead of me. Exactly the same rhythm. Top talk to talk talk I picked up the pace the trail widened a little and I could see way ahead to the entrance to the parking lot where my car was there it was again on a tree seemingly right next to me I truly started freaking out and started to book it back to the lot I was nearing the opening when time seemed to slow down. All of a sudden, it felt like the temperature dropped about 20 degrees, the birds stopped singing, and my simple Timex watch started to malfunction, making all sorts of beeping noises and the numbers glitching on the screen. The beat sounded impossibly loud this time, like it were hacked into every surrounding tree with an axe. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me as I anticipated hearing the rhythm again. I burst into the parking lot and everything went back to normal. The temperature was back in the mid seventies and birds were chirping away. I looked at my watch only to discover that it had gone completely blank. I stood there and stared at it until it flashed 12 o'clock, Monday, 101, January 1st. My watch had completely reset itself. It had never done this before. 
I got into the car and started the engine. The clock on the radio read 12. That couldn't be right. It should have been around 9.30 or 9.45 at the latest. So I threw her in reverse and backed up to where I could clearly make count was the main road. However, as I was about to throw the car into drive as it sat there, I heard a sharp rapping sound on the back window, like someone hitting it with their knuckles. It was the same beat. There was no one else in the parking lot when I finished my run. No cars, nothing. I didn't dare look back and hightailed it back to my grandmother's house. I have no idea what could have caused this series of events and I still could not explain it to this day. I was geocaching once and as I was wandering through the woods, I came across a small patch of trees that had Mr. Potato Head faces nailed to them. I was a 15 kilometer drive from civilization and nowhere near a trail. As the catch was deep in the woods, I contacted the catch owner and he swore that they weren't there when he put the catch together and it was his private land. So nobody should have put them there. The other instance of weird was up when I was hitchhiking and decided to set up camp off in the woods not far from the highway. I had a fire, ate and set up my little tent and fell asleep without problem. I woke up in the middle of the night due to some heavy breathing outside my tent. I listened for a bit scared shitless and then some movement and the sound was gone. I woke up the next morning and there was a photo of my family stuck with a nail to a tree right beside my tent and fresh footprints in the dirt. Being the idiot that I am, I followed the path of the footprints a kilometer or so back into the woods, where it ended at a road. Across the street was an abandoned house, and while checking out the house for anything useful, I found several of the photos of people from the photo, individuals, headshots, and notes apologizing for not protecting them or being there for them. I got a feeling like I wasn't alone and decided to make an exit. And as I came out of the house, there was a pickup truck in the road watching me leave. He offered me a ride back to the highway and some food and drink and told me all about the family that lived there and how they had all died. Apparently, the father had an accident whilst driving and struck an oncoming vehicle with the mother and two kids inside it. He lived but everybody else died. My brother James was part of the orienteering team in high school. For those of you who don't know, orienteering is where they get you to go to the middle of nowhere in teams of two. They give you a map, a compass, and you must find your way back to each check in station in order and it's a race so my brother and his partner set out and make it through the first few checkpoints and they're feeling pretty solid but they don't make it to the next one when they're supposed to they double check the map do some math and figure out that they miscalculated some angle or another and are now almost off the edge of the map they recalculate and set off in a new direction. Keep in mind, the line was never intended to be part of the orienteering run. This is unexplored territory. And they came across what my brother said could only be described as a crater, a deep bowl in the forest devoid of trees. And at the center was an ambulance. They are in the woods miles upon miles from any road 
and there is an ambulance that looks like it's decades old sitting in a crater. So, being teenage boys, they decide to investigate it. My brother said that the forest was well on its way to reclaiming the vehicle, that it was rusted and covered in plant life. It looked out of date, like it was coming from the 40s or some bygone era. In the back, the gurney was still there, but bent in the middle, like something had smashed it. There were brown smears on the walls that could have been rust or dirt or shit or blood. They both got a horrible feeling from the place and took off out of there. My brother thinks he could probably find it again, but flat out refuses to. I am a hunter and mountaineer. It was a chilly December morning, and I hiked in pre-dawn. I'm talking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trail. I got to my nest, and about half an hour before sunrise, and started to settle in. The wind kicked up a fog, and the fog rolled in that was thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Within a few minutes, my visibility was about five inches. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind, when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound, indicative of an imminently successful hunt, sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around in my 30-30 as quietly as I could, and lay flat on my back, tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peek over the mountains to the east, and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or besides me. I remember laying the rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it is to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, so I had likely stumbled into a herd of whitetails that had bedded down and decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately, as it was fully dawn by now. I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally around me. It wasn't. Seemingly nothing was. By now the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all that day, without seeing as much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind in an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I had ever felt. Lawfully, once you make your way back to the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle, but not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop and listen, and I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. I was about a hundred feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I am a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me up something fierce. It was early 1984. My two friends and I went to the Wildwood campgrounds on Long Island with my family. It was a safer time back then, so we thought we'd explore the forest. We went up to the cliffs looking down at the beach and back into the woods 
soon becoming bored, so we headed deeper in. The woods were dark, tangled and overgrown with weeds and brambles. It was obvious the area was not used or even explored often as it was so dense. So we started heading back. We noticed something upon our return, a house in the middle of the forest. Most windows broken with a sagging roof, old and out of place, with no road leading to it and no power lines either. It had a mailbox at the front, as well as a brick chimney. We entered the small home, of only a few rooms on the ground level, and a gaping hole in the floor, shown an exposed basement below. A rotting wooden table, surrounded by peeling wallpaper, of roses that sat next to the kitchen. There was a collection of old things, and what I identified as a very small, white gas stove, speckled with corrosion. The stairs up and down looked unsafe and rickety. Small animal feces was everywhere, and I don't remember any electrical sockets, lights, or anything of that nature. It must have been from the early 20s or 30s, and the forest had began to grow around it. The whole place was creepy and smelt like egg or a struck match. But what made it really creepy was the hole in the floor. We could only see part of it as the floor bowed and we feared getting too close. We could see on the basement floor that there were hundreds of playing cards, but only red ones, hearts and diamonds. I'd guessed that they were all red. Everything else was really dark. They were poured up in a heaping pile. For why or if anything was underneath them, we will never know, because it scared us for some reason. The dark hole lit only by that spot, making the white and red cards seemed brighter. They were clean. They were new. And we got the hell out of there. I live by a small river, and my friend and I always spoke about putting a boat on it one night, and just letting the current take us downstream whilst we fished all night. Well a few years ago, we finally did it. We loaded up the boat with our fishing poles and a case of beer, and headed out around 10pm. We put the boat in up the river and my friend's girlfriend drove the truck home. The trip was only about four miles in a straight line, but throw in the curves of the river, and it was doubling back on itself. The actual trip was more like 15 miles. We'd been told it'd take about six hours, so we got to the river around midnight, and expected to be home before 7am. The river was really low that night, but we didn't expect it to be an issue, so we shoved off. The first few hours passed pretty normally, and we caught a few fish, but we passed a cutoff, and the river current just slowed to a halt. Around 2am, we hear this faint groaning noise off in the distance. We didn't think much of it at first, because we are both campers and we're used to the forest noises. As we keep moving slowly down the river, the groaning noises keep happening, and it's getting louder. I can't even really accurately describe the noise itself. It was a very throaty, groan slash moaning sound, with a short duration. I say it was like a zombie noise, but it was very distinct and at times it sounded like a man groaning in pain. For the next half hour, the noise got louder, until it felt like it was literally just out of sight on land, and it was loud. So I mentioned the river was really low. Well at this point in our trip, the river walls were nearly vertical and 10 feet high. 
This sound is at its loudest right now. But as we go down the river, it doesn't get any quieter. We aren't moving past the groaning. It's following us in the darkness of the forest. We're both getting weirded out about it. And we're both assholes. And we're amplifying the situation by coming up with all kinds of scary things that it could be. It's a zombie. Or a dying man trying to yell for help. A banshee. A ghost. Or could it be a serial killer messing with us? Maybe it's a siren trying to lure us off course. As it nears 3am, we're way behind schedule. To say I'm on edge is an understatement. I was trying to play it cool because my friend was playing it cool. And I didn't want him thinking that I'm a pussy. We're shining our flashlights into the forest. And we're watching as things scurry off in the darkness as the light hits it. The groaning is still going on. The loud groaning happens about once a minute. And something there is a quieter, slightly different sound that happens in between. The sound is finally behind us, but it wasn't getting much quieter. With the sound behind us, we figured we were in the clear, but we weren't so lucky. About five minutes later, we hit a log jam, and our only choice was to go ashore and carry the boat around the debris. There was one problem. We couldn't actually get out of the river. As mentioned, the river walls were 10 foot high, and our only choice was to go back up the river a couple of hundred feet to a low spot and carry it all the way round. Now, I was really dreading about getting out of the river. It's dangerous enough walking down the river banks in the pitch blackness, and I didn't need a zombie banshee serial killer making it worse. So we turned the boat around and head back towards the sound. We pull the boat out of the river and the sound just stops. This is it. It is definitely a serial killer taunting us. And now that we're out of the water, he's moving in for the kill. There is no more acting manly and unafraid. My friend knows I'm freaked out and I'm sure that he is too. The boat is usually kind of heavy but tonight it feels lighter than ever. We're practically jogging that thing down the muddy banks. Everywhere we look, we see what is ducking behind a tree and staying out of the light from our flashlights. We finally get past the log jam. We're putting the boat back in the river and whatever is following us is right behind us. I'm in the boat and my friend is getting in. He pushes us off out the river and runs around and yells into the darkness. What do you want? At this point, the Loch Ness monster steps into the light and says, I need about tree footing. Okay, that part didn't happen. But we get back on the boat in the river and the noise has suddenly stopped. But we're both ready to go home. We run the motor until we get to a bridge. My friend calls his girlfriend and gets her to come pick us up two hours earlier than expected. She asks why we cut the trip short and he makes up some bullshit excuse about the river being too shallow and blocked up with debris because neither of us wanted to admit that we were grown ass men being scared of the dark. I never told anyone else I know about this and I don't think he has but we still mimic the sound every now and then, and any strange noise is instantly referred to as a zombie banshee. I live by a small river, and my friend and I always spoke about putting a boat on it one night, and just letting the current take us downstream whilst we fished all night. Well, a few years ago, we finally did it. We loaded up the boat with our fishing poles and a case of beer and headed out around 10 p.m. We put the boat in up the river and my friend's girlfriend drove the truck home. The trip was only about four miles in a straight line, but throw in the curves of the river and it was doubling back on itself. 
the actual trip was more like 15 miles. We'd been told it'd take about six hours. So we got to the river around midnight and expected to be home before 7 a.m. The river was really low that night, but we didn't expect it to be an issue. So we shoved off. The first few hours passed pretty normally and we caught a few fish but we passed a cutoff and the river current just slowed to a halt. Around 2 a.m. we hear this faint groaning noise off in the distance. We didn't think much of it at first because we are both campers and we're used to the forest noises. As we keep moving slowly down the river, the groaning noises keep happening and it's getting louder. I can't even really accurately describe the noise itself. It was a very throaty groan slash moaning sound with a short duration. I say it was like a zombie noise, but it was very distinct. And at times it sounded like a man groaning in pain for the next half hour. The noise got louder until it felt like it was literally just out of sight on land and it was loud. So I mentioned the river was really low. Well, at this point in our trip, the river walls were nearly vertical and 10 feet high. The sound is at its loudest right now, but as we go down the river, it doesn't get any quieter. We aren't moving past the groaning. It's following us in the darkness of the forest. We're both getting weirded out about it. And we're both assholes. And we're amplifying the situation by coming up with all kinds of scary things that it could be. It's a zombie. Or a dying man trying to yell for help. A banshee. A ghost. Or could it be a serial killer messing with us? Maybe it's a siren trying to lure us off course. As it nears 3 a.m., we're way behind schedule. To say I'm on edge is an understatement. I was trying to play it cool because my friend was playing it cool, and I didn't want him thinking that I'm a pussy. We're shining our flashlights into the forest, and we're watching as things scurry off in the darkness as the light hits it. The groaning is still going on. The loud groaning happens about once a minute. And something there is a quieter, slightly different sound that happens in between. The sound is finally behind us, but it wasn't getting much quieter. With the sound behind us, we figured we were in the clear, but we weren't so lucky. About five minutes later, we hit a log jam and our only choice was to go ashore and carry the boat around the debris. There was one problem. We couldn't actually get out of the river. As mentioned, the river walls were 10 foot high and our only choice was to go back up the river a couple of hundred feet to a low spot and carry it all the way round. Now, I was really dreading about getting out of the river. It's dangerous enough walking down the river banks in the pitch blackness and I didn't need a zombie banshee serial killer making it worse. So we turned the boat around and head back towards the sound. We pull the boat out of the river and the sound just stops. This is it. It is definitely a serial killer taunting us. And now that we're out of the water, he's moving in for the kill. There is no more acting manly and unafraid. My friend knows I'm freaked out, and I'm sure that he is too. The boat is usually kind of heavy, but tonight it feels lighter than ever. We're practically jogging that thing down the muddy banks. Everywhere we look, we see what is ducking behind a tree and staying out of the light from our flashlights. We finally get past the log jam. We're putting the boat back in the river and whatever is following us is right behind us. I'm in the boat and my friend is getting in. He pushes us off out the river and runs around and yells into the darkness. What do you want? At this point, 
the Loch Ness Monster steps into the light and says, I need about tree footy. Okay, that part didn't happen. But we get back on the boat in the river and the noise has suddenly stopped. But we're both ready to go home. We run the motor until we get to a bridge. My friend calls his girlfriend and gets her to come pick us up two hours earlier than expected. She asks why we cut the trip short, and he makes up some bullshit excuse about the river being too shallow and blocked up with debris, because neither of us wanted to admit that we were grown ass men being scared of the dark. I never told anyone else I know about this, and I don't think he has, but we still mimic the sound every now and then, and any strange noise is instantly referred to as a zombie banshee. One night, I was solo camping in a remote lake above a small town. You're not allowed to camp near the lake. So I hiked up a little ways onto the hillside and set up underneath a camouflage tarp. It must have been around midnight. I was all snuggled in my hammock when I hear laughing and yelling in the distance. I peek up from behind my tarp to see what looks like a handful of college aged dudes drinking and fishing and having a good time. Okay, whatever. I try to sleep anyway. I drift in and out for about an hour, but I'm kept from sleeping by an extremely loud bird in the tree next to me that just keeps hooting and screeching. Eventually, I pick up a large branch and thunk swinging it at the tree to shut it up. Suddenly, the dude bros go silent. I can tell that they've frozen and are looking intently in my direction, trying to find the source of the noise. I crawl back into my sleeping bag and try to sleep. But the bird starts again. I decide I need to find some pine cones or something to throw at it to scare it away. So I get out of my sleeping bag, move outside the tarp, and start looking on the ground. I decide to try the branch again, and slam it as hard as I can into the tree trunk, and the sound rings out loudly. They all look over to see a pale naked figure, hunched over in the tree line, staring at them. I immediately scramble on all fours under my tarp. To them, it must have looked like some horrible pale creature disappeared into the underbrush after having been caught observing them. They go silent, have a muffled, terrified conversation, and pack up and leave. I slept soundly for the rest of the night, but those guys must have been pretty freaked out. This happened when I was in high school in the 90s. I grew up in a rural western town. That meant not a lot to do, but lots of places out in the heavily wooded canyons and hills right outside of town. One particularly popular spot for hanging out, hiking, rock climbing and doing various other activities, was called Falling Rock. It's right along the rim of Dark Canyon and features pine woods going from highway straight out to a sharp, abrupt drop off down a sandstone slash limestone cliff. It's several hundred feet down to the creek at the bottom, and there are various hiking trails and ways to get around the cliffs and down the creek. I went there frequently with friends in high school, not to smoke weed or drink or whatever, but because the place was also held as sacred by the Lakota and by proximity, by teenage wannabe Wiccans like me. We'd see their red prayer bundles up in the cedars all along the cliffs, and to me and my coven of fellow dumbasses, that made this an obvious place to try and visit and contact spirits. I hiked it enough to become very familiar with the area, especially with a deep overhang that was almost like a shallow cave. It wasn't visible from the top of the cliff or from the main hiking trails, 
I only learnt about it after someone showed me how to get to it by scooting down a steep incline between two particular pine trees on my butt. Also during this very confused part of my life, I had a best friend who was an extremely bad influence and who kept getting me involved with older guys. At 15, I lost my virginity to a 22 year old guy in the Air Force that she had introduced me to and then left me alone with. I won't say he made me do anything, but I also won't say I was entirely on board when everything happened. She later gave me away for a night to a Turkish guy who spoke no English. Then she started seeing a guy in his early 20s. She was 18 and more or less told his 40 year old something uncle that I was all his if he wanted. I was a 16 year old dumbass. I didn't know about this scheme. I just knew that my best friend had just invited me up to Falling Rock to hang out with her and her boyfriend. I was less happy when I showed up and found the uncle there. I'd met him before and he wasn't a dick or unattractive. Actually, he was quite attractive or even especially creepy. It was just knowing he was more than twice my age and very clearly wanted much more than the Air Force guy had. He didn't just want sex. He was in love with me and wanted me to love him too. I knew it. I just didn't know what to do about it. But I did tell my friend I didn't want to see him around when she and I got together. She apparently ignored that bit of what I said. He and my best friend's boyfriend were both cowboys following the rodeo circuit. As such, they showed up at Falling Rocks in their boots and hats and all of that. And it made them slow. My friend was morbidly obese and none of them knew anything about Falling Rock, whereas I know the area very well. I had driven my own vehicle there, but had parked in the lower lot, about a quarter of a mile closer to the highway than the place where they parked theirs. When I saw that their uncle was there and he started getting overly friendly right away, I planned to get away as soon as possible. We started walking and it wasn't before long that I got ahead of them and ignored their calls to come back and vanished into the woods down one of the less used hiking paths. This was broad daylight and I had a plan. I was going to just loop around the northwest through the thick woods and come back up the lower parking lot, getting to my car and drive away and let my friend explain why she brought the uncle later. I made good time and got back up towards the road to the main parking area where my friend and the uncle had parked. I was almost there when I saw another guy close to the uncle's age, but slimmer, blonde with a beard and a camouflage coat on coming up from the trail in the parking area. We were a few hundred yards away from each other, but he stopped clearly seeing me. I don't know what it was, but I didn't like something about his stance. His expression, I don't know what. I started to slink back down the drawer I had come up and he started to follow. No mistaking it. He turned off a well-worn obvious path to the falling rock cliff face to follow me, little teenaged girl, down into nothing but deer trails and scrub and cacti. He didn't say anything all the while. It seemed like he was trying to be as quiet as possible. I knew the area better than he did though, and was a lot less cautious about my footing. I got back to the top of the cliff as quickly as I could and popped up just ahead of where the uncle was sauntering along the edge, right next to where the big overhang would be. The uncle and I saw each other. I pointed back down the trail where the strange guy with a beard could clearly be heard stomping up behind me. And then I dropped down on my ass and boots scooted right out of sight. I got to the overhang and heard the exchange between the uncle and bearded guy. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Asks the uncle, sounding absolutely pissed. I'm looking for my girlfriend. She just came up here. She's got dark hair. Oh yeah? What color shirt she wearing? I was wearing a gray hoodie with my dad's college logo on it. It's a gray hoodie, said the bearded guy. 
the uncle proceeded to go absolutely batshit, yelling and cursing, and based on the noise, throwing fallen tree limbs on the other guy, and the other guy just ran. I could hear him thumping and crashing down the steep hillside not far from me. My friend's boyfriend kept running when he heard all the noise, and I could hear him yelling at the guy too. All kinds of vile shit you wouldn't think a good Christian boy would say. The uncle called my name for a bit, and I finally came out of the cave. And then, my fat friend finally joined us too. It was a weird day to have your sort of stalker save you from someone who seemed to really have it out for you, but I'm pretty sure that's just what he did. I wish I could say something better by him, but all I really did was disappear. I didn't talk to my friend for over a year, long enough for her to dump her boyfriend and for the uncle to go away with him. I don't know what happened to either of them. I don't know if I could recognise them now, as I'm twice the age I was then. I do wish them well though, but still, would rather not meet again. When I was around 13, I went camping with my Girl Scout troop. This wasn't uncommon for us, as we camped often, at least twice a year. The only difference was that my troop had the privilege to camp out two nights in a cabin. The cabins were not big. I was five foot, and if I were to lay down widthwise, we only had about three feet of walking space between the bunks. Each side had two sets of bunk beds, so there were eight beds in each cabin, and there were four cabins. We had a large troop, so we occupied three cabins, including the mums, who stayed the night with us. During the day activities, we went on as normal. Other troops came to spend the day, and we did arts and crafts and archery, and other sport-like events. This ended around seven, when all the other girls went home. Around this time, we cooked dinner, ate, spoke, and then started a fire. We sat around and had girl talk like normal, ate doughboys and marshmallows until nine, when we had to go to bed due to the camp's curfew. In my cabin, I had my two best friends, one in the bed below me, and the other in the bunk across from me. We had bunks that were the closest to the window. To imagine the cabin, just imagine a rectangle with walls, and a screen door. Now, go into the screen door, and on either side of you, there are, as I said, four bunks, and at each end of the corridor or window. My mum was sleeping in the cabin across the way with my troop leader and the other mum. Soon we're all asleep, but my friend Lisa, who was below me, isn't very good at sleeping outside, and was soon awake and sitting on the edge of my bunk, poking me. I cracked my eyes open and shone my flashlight at Lisa, then at Tara, who was sitting across the way. She was awake as well. So as we weren't technically allowed to be awake unless we were using the bathroom, we decided to go get my mum, who would take us through the trail to the bathroom, just to let Lisa catch a breather. By now, the fire was basically out, and we had my flashlight as our light source. So we bundled up, because New England is freezing at night, even if it's spring. As we were getting dressed, I put my flashlight in my mouth so that I could use both hands, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow. I thought it was my own, and Camp was playing tricks on me, but I looked anyway. My scream may have broken all the rules in Camp about curfew. My entire cabin was up. My friends were screaming, and my mum and my leader were trampling over each other to get into the cabin. When I turned to look at the shadow, I saw what was actually a man staring through the window. I don't know how long he was there for, and when I started screaming, he took off. My troop leader talked to the ranger the next day, and he said that he would talk to the night ranger, but we never got any other answers other than maybe it was an animal. Either way, we never went camping there again, and this incident still haunts me to this day. So, creepy pervy man, let's not meet again. The man who told me about his terrifying experience in the Colorado wilderness is one of those distant relatives that everyone has. They're your third cousin, twice removed, or something to that effect. 
I'm not positive how exactly we're related, but he is an incredible guy. Greg is a decorated green beret with a silver star to his name that he earned by capturing the leader of an Afghan sniper cell without incurring any casualties. Despite his status as a huge badass and his not unconsiderable size of 6 foot 3 and 200 pounds, Greg is a teddy bear. He is an extremely humble and kind person. I've had a lot of experiences in the outdoors, having lived in Colorado for most of my life, and Greg and I have had extended conversations about our adventures in the woods at my grandma's house for Thanksgiving. We were sitting on the couch, wearing tacky holiday sweaters, when the conversation turned to hunting. Greg mentioned offhandedly that he used to be an avid hunter, but had an experience that turned him off it. He said he doesn't even like guns anymore, something I found surprising coming from such an accomplished soldier. I pushed him to tell me what happened, and thought he seemed uncomfortable with the idea, but he finally relented and did tell me. I'm going to switch this to first person now, to tell it to you in the same way that Greg told this story to me. It was late October, which means elk season up in Indian Peaks Wilderness and I went up there to bag a few elk, and just relax for a few days by myself. I parked the truck near a trailhead, about 8 miles from where I wound up setting up camp, and was looking forward to a nice weekend in the woods with some peace and quiet after packing all my gear in and getting ready. The first morning, I was in my deer blind, about 20 feet up a tree with a cup of coffee and my rifle. The sun had just come up about an hour ago. About 50 yards from my tree, the tree line ended and opened into this big meadow where a lot of the elk tended to roll through and I could sight my rifle pretty well through the trees and see most of this big grassy area. Perhaps a couple of hours had passed which isn't really boring in the deep woods. I just drank coffee from my thermos and listened to all the life around me, feeling the woods getting ready for winter. I couldn't believe my luck when I glanced over at the meadow and saw a large group of elk had started grazing in the meadow. The silent animals plodded along, oblivious to me watching. Among the group, was one of the most beautiful elk I had ever seen. It's what was called a monarch, which mean it had antlers with eight points each, something really rare. I quietly clicked the safety of my rifle and sighted it. When you're hunting an animal like this, you want to put a bullet right where the skull meets the spine in order to sever the spinal column and kill it instantly and painlessly. The focus, when you get it in the zone, is incredible. I swear I could feel the firing pin punch forward and the bullet would leave the barrel as I pulled the trigger. That beautiful elk went down silently and all the others scattered for the tree line. I was ecstatic about the shot and the elk as I climbed down out of the blind and set off for the meadow. I had left my rifle in my blind, something I regretted soon, and had only my small knife on me to gut the animal and drag it back to camp. As I was making the short walk between my blind and the meadow, I noticed that the woods around me were completely silent. Some of this is normal after you fire a gun in the woods, but for it to drag on this long was unsettling. I thought nothing of it, and continued to walk the short walk through the dense pines, as I was about to clear the trees and step into the meadow, I noticed something odd. I could see the elk's body lying in the grass through the trees, but there was something else. There was what looked like another elk, antlers and all, on the opposite side of the dead elk from where I was coming to walk out of the tree line. 
almost looking as though it were gently nuzzling the elk's dead body. This was weird. To see an elk treat a dead elk like this, they usually scatter, but I continued walking towards it, trapezing in the duff and hollering in an attempt to startle this other elk off. It snapped its head and looked up at me. Over the body of its fallen friend, this strange new elk eyed me with an unafraid glare. I say glare because it didn't feel like an animal looking at me anymore. Its glassy black eyes gave me the same caught, red-handed feeling that you got when your parents would catch you doing something wrong. I felt suddenly uncomfortable and out of place in the woods that I loved so much, and somehow hated and guilty. I no longer wanted the elk, and I stopped dead in my tracks, and watched this animal, and it eyed me angrily. What it did next gives me nightmares to this day. The thing that stood before me on the other side of the dead elk must have been lying on its stomach, and it put its arms down and pushed up, putting its legs underneath it. It reared back, glaring at me along with its evil glass eyes. My breath caught in my throat. Most of its body was at least somewhat human, but terribly emaciated and elongated. It appeared to stand at least ten feet tall, not including the antlers atop of the elk's head. It was bald everywhere but the neck up. It looked stickly pale and pink, its legs at the knee bent backwards, like the back legs of an elk. This horrible, skinny, naked, unnatural thing just stood there, glowering at me, with a hatred that was palpable. The woods around us were silent. It might have been a second, minute, or hours. I felt the disapproving parent feeling shift. I felt more like an ant under a shoe. I took a step back. My boots felt ten pounds. My body felt numb. And the noise of my footstep was ear-splitting. I took one more, and then ran. Running through thick woods is tough, but I ran faster than I have ran in my life. I passed under my blind with my $4,000 rifle sitting in it, without even slowing down. I ran all the way back to my camp, which must have been a mile, before I stopped and took my breath. It took me another minute to dare to look behind me. I was alone, but the woods around me were still silent and brooding. I wanted more than anything to pack up and go home, but I knew that I could not make it back to the car before nightfall, and I didn't want to be exposed at night. I cooked an MRE in my tent and stayed there for the rest of the night. When night fell, I wrapped myself in my sleeping bag and tried to sleep, but I couldn't stop myself from starting at every little noise. I kept thinking about possible rational explanations for what I saw. Maybe there's a crazy guy out there who found an elk head and is wearing it around scaring people. But no explanation I came up with quelled the maddening feeling of fear that I felt. The horrible sense of being hated and guilty and far from home. And nothing explained why that thing was ten feet tall with inverted knees. As soon as the sun came up, I ran back to the blind and took it down. Then, I ran back to camp with my rifle and pack, packed everything up and hiked out. I've never fired a gun in the woods since, and I don't intend to ever again. I'm not a spiritual person. But if that wasn't something in the forest telling me to leave it alone, I don't know what is. I can take a hint. I don't think I'll ever know exactly what that creature was, but I know what I saw. Next time you're up in the woods alone, be quiet, be respectful, and don't kill anything that you don't have to. I thought at first that Greg's story was too far-fetched to be true, but as he told it, I saw how truly scared he was. This confident, softly spoken military man 
was stuttering through his story, hands shaking and face pale. I still don't know what to make of it. But the area he said it occurred is one I'm quite familiar with, and it can be an eerie place. Sometimes, being alone in the woods can feel like anything but. It just might be that there's some force out there, some inhuman creature who guards the woods. Just in case, I take extra care to be respectful whenever I'm among nature. You never know who could be watching. I'm not convinced there is an afterlife, or such a thing as ghosts or demons, but I once saw something in the woods that felt so unnatural, it made me second guess how I see the world. I was hiking up a hillside, thick with trees, in the middle of the night during a long weekend. Some friends and I decided we would hike to the top of the hill and light off some fireworks. Approaching the hill and surrounding the base of the hill was a rolling grass valley. It was around midnight, full moon and a light mist, something straight out of a horror movie. The strange part was, I wasn't nervous or scared or anything. I was having a great night with my buddies. I didn't have any of my defences up. My buddies and I just hiked in a straight line through the rolling grass valley approaching the hill when something caught my eye. On my right, I saw a tall shadowy figure standing perfectly upright on the top of a small grassy hill. It was standing there right next to a large dead tree. I couldn't make out any details. Both the tree and the tall figure were silhouetted underneath the moonlight. The strange part was seeing this figure didn't scare me. I didn't immediately sense any threat. I almost assumed it might have just been another hiker or somebody having a smoke. I passively turned my flashlight on it, and that's when it happened. In an instant, as my light hit the spot where the figure was standing, it instantly moved just outside the range of my flashlight, like it teleported or something. But just as vividly, I saw it standing in its initial spot as my light hit that spot and the figure moved. I could see it standing just outside my range of light. My breath paused in an instant and a wave of dread washed over me. Something felt a hundred percent unnatural about what just happened. As a reflex, I moved my light to the new spot where the figure was and as my light passed it, it disappeared. I've never passed out in my entire life. Not from heat, not from getting knocked out, never. But in that moment I felt my knees give way from underneath me and I fell to the ground. My friends turned and looked at me trying to pick myself up from my knees and they were too wobbly to stand. They helped me and I tried explaining to them what I experienced. Perhaps it was all just shadows and lights and my eyes messing with me. But I'll never be able to explain that sensation. The feeling. The feeling like I had just seen something. Something I shouldn't have seen. Something so unnatural that my body's instinctual reaction was to just go limp. My father used to have a business in maintaining the woods. It's a thing in my country. It basically means cutting down dead trees and hauling them out of the area, as well as generally being a tree surgeon. This means that he was out in the woods all day and he was allowed in places normal citizens couldn't go to because of the rules of the Forestry Commission. My dad was working in the early morning when he suddenly noticed a car in the middle of the woods. It drove through a small path normally only used by the foresters. It wasn't a car from the Forestry Commission, so he thought it was very weird. However, dad was alone and it was the 80s, so there were no mobile phones to contact anyone. 
since it was in the middle of nowhere, he decided to ignore it. He kept on hauling wood through the woods with his horse, and he suddenly heard the men speaking. Now my dad is a brave man, and as strong as a bear, so he decided to just have a quick peek to see what the hell those folks were doing. My dad looked around some thick bushes to make sure he could see the men, and they were digging a hole. My father decided that it was something he really didn't want to interrupt, and he kept working throughout the day like nothing ever happened. He made sure to keep some distance between him and the digging site. The men apparently never noticed my dad, possibly because his equipment wasn't located in the same direction that the men came from, and my father worked with horses, so they weren't any loud machines. It was the 80s after all. At the end of the day, my father went to the local commission office and reported it, and they called the police. After they went to investigate, they found a body of a young woman buried there. It still irks my dad to this day. He was out there alone. What if the man saw him? What if he decided to check the burial ground out himself? Scary shit. A few weeks ago, we were on a road trip from British Columbia to San Diego, and we came upon a campsite just outside of Crescent City, California. We drove through it. One side of the campground was relatively empty, and I noticed a few scattered tents, but nobody close to the location we ended up picking. We had tons of space. We wanted an early night, so I started a fire whilst my girlfriend began cooking. We ate it, had a few beers, and climbed into our rooftop tents, with our dog by 9pm or so. I had a rough time sleeping, and woke up a few times but finally fell into a decent sleep. In the pitch dark, with all of our tent windows and canvases closed, I was awoken at 1am by someone whistling outside our tent, the tune of When the Saints Come Marching In. After a few minutes of this repetitive whistling, I nudged my girlfriend who awoke and was obviously freaked out as well. The whistling then turned to chanting things like when you sleep, you disrespect me. When you disrespect me, you disrespect the US Marines. The person would then start spelling out words like flee, and the verbiage and tone kept getting more aggressive, so we decided we had to make a move. I slowly unzipped the tent whilst our guard dog was snoring, and got my head out of the tent. I took a few seconds to let my eyes adjust, and figure out where the person was. I felt more confident once I could somewhat see and hear, so I climbed down and my girlfriend passed me the dog, and she climbed down too. We flipped the tent up without securing it, and we jumped to the truck, while the person was still whistling. We went to a motel in Crescent City. The next morning we drove back to get a few belongings that weren't in the truck, and a family who had been camping a few sites over said it went over for two or three hours and it was the scariest thing that their family had ever experienced. When I was young, my dad lived in an old log cabin about 15 miles west of Sheridan, Wyoming, in the foothills of Bighorn Mountain. Every summer when I was visiting, we would go up to the mountains backpacking and fishing for two days every weekend. We would park the truck, hike into a remote area, fishing for trout along the way, and make camp wherever we ended up. We encountered a number of strange and creepy things, and got into some scary situations with wildlife. But the situation that sticks out with me the most was an ancient abandoned camp we found. We were hiking down a very steep slope to get to an area of a creek that had been dammed up by beavers, hoping to catch some big trout. I had climbed out on a rock ledge and was looking for a way down, when 
I saw the stock and action of an old rusty rifle sticking out of a tree, where the tree had grown around the barrel for years before. It was around 10 feet above the ground. Dad and I climbed down to check it out, and we found a small cave at the base of the rock, a formation only about 12 inches deep, which would make a nice natural shelter but a really terrible place to set up a long-term camp. Inside we found a bunch of really old stuff. Three heavy gauge unopened cans of food, an old cast iron pot that had holes rusted in all the way through, a crusty old saddle and bridle set, a very deteriorated heavy woolen blanket rolled up and tied with a leather belt. When we unwrapped the blanket, we found several personal items, including a rusty old cap, a ball black powder revolver, a leather satchel with a lead pistol shot, and a powder horn with no black powder in it, tarnished old cartridges, presumably for the rifle of the tree, a straight razor, and most unsettling of all, was a shirt with holes in it, and over half of it stained with dried blood. As we stood there thinking about what all of this meant, it occurred to me how remote this place was, even at the time of July 1985, and the fact that whoever owned that shirt had been very seriously injured. Stuck on a steep slope in the middle of absolutely nowhere, I got serious chills down my spine. The only thing that somewhat dated this fateful campsite was the pistol and the rifle, both of which were made sometime in the 1870s according to my father. There's no way to ever know what happened to the man who owned all this stuff, but the fact that he, or someone he knew, obviously shot twice with either a gun or arrow, and all of his belongings were sitting right there where he left them possibly a hundred years later, it was highly unlikely that he left the area alive. Discovering what amounts to an 100 year old crime scene in this very remote wilderness kind of gave me the creeps, but mostly it just made me sad to know how hopeless and alone this guy must have felt when he died. I asked my dad if I could keep the pistol and he simply said, it's not mine to give and we're not thieves. He chose instead to teach me a lesson about respecting the dead and preserving history. He had been very careful inspecting everything, and we put everything back, exactly as we had found it. My dad then told me to take my hat off and observe a moment of silence and reflection, as a sign of respect for the man who most likely lost his life on that mountain. Then we went fishing. I tried several times over the years to find that spot again, especially now that I have sons of my own. But sadly, I've never been able to find it. A few years back, we were doing a massive survey in the middle of nowhere in the interior of British Columbia. All the crews had gone home, and it was just my boss and myself left for a few days to follow up and confirm some coordinates and finish some mapping. We head out of the motel an hour or so into the bush middle of nowhere along deactivated logging roads. The closest town is miles and miles away, and we hike out to one area that we had found a few weeks previously. For some reason, the whole area just felt off. So we get down to business, and about 15 minutes after being haunched over mapping, there is this weird deafening womp sound, like I could feel pressure in my ears. I immediately looked at my boss about 20 feet away, and he is white as a ghost staring back at me, standing, and then it happens again. My ear and chest pressure go crazy, and it feels like I am being squeezed. Chills all over my body, and every hair is standing on end. My boss just looks at me and says, let's go. We grab all of our stuff and speed hike back to the truck. We never discussed it. No clue what it was, but I've never been so freaked out in my life. 
Thinking about it ten years later, I still get the chills. I was camping in the Florida Keys one winter. I managed to survive the large snakes, and even larger alligators, as well as the scorpions which would get into my shoes at night. But one experience that I shall never forget. My campsite was next to an old rock quarry, which had filled with water and made it a good place for swimming and getting water from. There was also an old dump site near the quarry, with piles of stoves and fridges and other junk. It had been there for a while, but nothing new had been added to it for a long time. One day, a fellow shows up and tells me that they were going to clean up the dump and burn some of the junk, so I better move my tent. So I gather up all of my belongings, and moved a few hundred yards back into the woods. That day, they started burning the garbage, and I thought nothing about it until I climbed into my tent at night. As soon as it got dark, and I was falling asleep, my tent became covered with hundreds of rats. I guess they had moved out of the dump because of the fire, and were just wandering around looking for food. They were everywhere, climbing up my ropes and over the top of the tent. I shook as many as I could off, and started a fire, and stayed up all night hoping they wouldn't return. They seemed to be gone, so the next night, I stayed in the same place, thinking they had moved to another dump or something. But no. As soon as it got dark, they all returned, bringing some of their friends, as it seemed that they were more than ever. I again shook them off my tent and got the fire going. When morning came, I packed up my tent and headed for a new place far away from those rats. As I was walking down the highway, wondering if I should return to another camping spot that I had previously been in, there, on the highway, near to the place, was a dead 11 foot alligator, which had crawled out from the mangroves only a few feet from where I had been camping a few weeks prior. I decided that my Florida camping adventure had gone on long enough, and headed home. When I was 18, me and my friends took a road trip about 7 hours or so down to Apichicola National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping drinking a few ice-cold Natty Lights, you know, 18-year-old stuff. As we didn't want to be bothered by any park rangers, we drove way deep into the woods. We got there, set up camp, and had said Natty Lights. And me and a guy decided to do a little exploring. So we walked about 100 yards from our site back to the main road, saw another path directly across from us, and started walking. Immediately we started seeing signs that someone had been living there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. I should have seen a huge red flag and turned around, but you know, I'm 18 and nothing can hurt me. So we get to this campsite of an older white guy living out of his van. Clothesline strung up, coolers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog, which I think was a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and starts up a conversation. He's friendly enough, and asks us where we're from, and he tells us some cool spots to check out. We ended up chatting to him for about 10 minutes, and then we went on our way. I kept thinking how odd it was that he gave directions in steps, not yards or miles, the guy seemed to be off balance, not stumbling drunk, but like he was walking on a balance beam, swaying side to side. Oh, and he was super excited to talk about national parks and forests and where we were from. So we went back to our tents. Fast forward two months, the same buddy calls me late at night and tells me to turn on the TV to the news. I oblige, and I see an old dude with a van, you see where this is heading, but I didn't. So I get pissed at my friend for waking me, and he insists that I should watch. And when I see the golden retriever, it all clicks. 
the man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He kidnapped and murdered a girl on Blood Mountain, Georgia, an older couple in Pisgah, North Carolina, and a girl in Apila Chicola at the campsite not long after we left. Yes, the very same places he had been talking to us about. Obviously, we called the cops, and they put us in touch with the FBI. We get flown down to take investigators to the campsite, point out every spot we saw, and tell them exactly what he told us, and show them the places he described to us. I didn't find out until after the trial, but apparently, they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in an area near the site, and I had to be flown down again to testify. 17 or 18 years ago, my fiance, now wife of nearly 16 years, and myself, and one other couple were hiking the Pyramid Point hiking trail in the Sleeping Bear Dunes of northwestern Lower Peninsula of Michigan at dusk. We had my old film camera with a 200mm zoom lens on it. We got to the Overlook, which looks northwest over the Manitou Passage to the Manitou Islands. We watched the sunset and entered that late dusk period that seems to last forever during a northern Michigan summer. It was probably 10 p.m. at this point. There were high winds and solid waves breaking on the shore below us. While standing and talking, we saw a light flash once out in the water between the islands and the mainland in the vicinity of North Manitou Shoal Lighthouse. We stopped and looked, but weren't creeped out by it. After all, Boaters are out in this stretch of water fairly regularly. I grabbed my camera and looked through the zoom lens and I could make out what appeared to be a small boat. Though it was difficult to tell with a 200mm lens as it's a 7 mile wide stretch of water to the nearest island. So we were probably 3-4 to four miles away from the actual light. We had flashlights so we shined our lights in the direction of the light that we'd seen waved it around, and immediately the light came back, and started flashing SOS in Morse code, which was a huge surprise to us. We weren't even sure our lights were bright enough to be seen at that distance, and given the stretch of shore, it's almost all forested. We were just a little spot several miles away. We were suddenly full of adrenaline and concern. Two of us ran back to the cars, which is half a mile through the woods in the dark down a hill with our flashlights, and got a cell phone and binoculars. While we were gone, the folks on the lookout had no light source. At the car, we called the Coast Guard from our cell phones. It was 1999, so these weren't smartphones by any stretch of imagination. We explained to the Coast Guard that someone was flashing SOS at us, out in the water, and that we were hikers, observing from Pyramid Point Overlook. They said that they would send a ship to look over the area, and we asked them to hurry. At this point, we ran back up to our overlook, with binoculars and phone and flashlight. Atop the overlook, there was no cell signal, so we had to pocket the phone, and had no further communications with the Coast Guard. With our binoculars, we were able to see a guy in an aluminium rowboat, rowing like crazy, with waves breaking over the bow of his boat. It was nearly pitch black outside, so we were only barely able to make the sound. It was about 10.30 or 45 at this point. During Michigan summer, it's still light enough to see outside. But anyway, he would occasionally turn around and flash SOS at us, and go back to rowing. It was disturbing to be several miles away, completely helpless, whilst we watched this guy struggling in a rowboat in the dark. It got dark, and we could not see anything anymore, but every few minutes the man in the boat would flash SOS. He did not appear to be making any progress towards the mainland, 
but he was clearly drifting northwestwards through the Manitou Passage. Every time he flashed, we'd turn on our flashlight and shine it back at him for a few seconds and turn it off. We did not know Morse code and had no cell signal. We stood and watched for what seemed like forever, completely helpless. The man stopped flashing his light and it was too dark to see his boat. And then a tugboat appeared that did not appear to be the Coast Guard ship, showed up and started doing a grid search pattern through the passage with bright lights shining from around the water. The Manitou Passage is probably six to seven miles wide and six to seven miles long. So it was a slow search and a smallish Coast Guard ship started doing searches at the northern end of the Straits, also with bright lights. They met in the middle of the Straits, having done a zigzag type pattern for what felt like an eternity, then sailed off. They didn't find anyone. We drove into a bar in Glen Arbor to see if there was anything on the news, and there wasn't. We called the Coast Guard the next morning, wondering if we'd seen a man die or help to rescue. But the person on duty had no idea what happened, or that we'd even called the night before. So to this day, it's unsettling to me, knowing how harsh the conditions on Lake Michigan can be, and knowing that we'd seen a man flashing SOS at us through our binoculars just before it got dark was really bothersome. There's no closure, no happy or sad ending, no ending at all other than going back to our camp and hitting the sack. I have no idea what happened to him, and I really doubt I ever will. I was hiking and backpacking with two friends in Montana. We were probably five miles from the nearest paved road, and had hiked around two miles from the end of the dirt road. The spot isn't very well traveled, and is quite nondescript but we all enjoyed getting away from any crowds and being out relatively alone. So we always gravitated to areas like this for backcountry camping. We bought a fire and hung out, then piled into our tent. All is normal and we hadn't seen a soul or any recent sign of people since we left the paved roads. I have some trouble sleeping and was sort of just laying there for maybe 30 minutes and both my buddies passed out. That's when it got weird. I hear from my side of the tent a murmuring, which I was certain was a person making sounds underneath their breath. It didn't feel like real words, but almost like someone drunk was mumbling gibberish. My first thought was one of my buddies was sleep talking. I listened closer and it was definitely coming from outside. I woke up my friend closest to me and he woke me up with a what? A little irritated. And at the moment, the muttering stopped. I shooed him and whispered to him what I'd heard. We waited a second and it started again, but it seemed closer this time and he heard it too but we didn't hear any movement. I can still hear the voice and it really messes with me 10 years later. He gave me a what the hell face and proceeded to gesture that he was gonna unzip the door and see what was outside. Right as he starts moving the zipper, we heard what sounded like someone taking a huge gasp of air before diving into a pool, seemingly from the opposite side of the tent of where we heard the original muttering from. We both froze for a second before he pushed his flashlight out and looked in that direction and screamed, Who's out there? We didn't see anything and never heard a single twig or the sound of movement. But this time, my other friend had woken up and we were all still freaking out. We told him what was up and we all took our flashlights out to see what the hell it was and we saw nothing at all. We were both up for a long time after that while the sleeping friend was out again fairly shortly thereafter. 
We didn't hear another odd sound at all, and in the morning there were no signs that anyone had been there. We cut our trip to just that night, and moved back to a campground the following day. We still have no idea what or who was outside our tent. The only thing that we could even make a semblance of a sense of was an owl, bat, or another bird. But I've spent many nights outdoors in that habitat, and I am familiar with those noises. This was entirely different in my opinion, and didn't come from any animal I'm aware of anyway. Still gives me chills thinking about it. I have a couple of stories about camping. One year, I was working for the forestry for the summer, so I decided to camp out by where the work was. I would go into town only once or twice a month for supplies. On the forestry road on the way there, there was a fellow camping a few miles from my setup. He wasn't working with me, so I figured maybe he was a hunter or something. After a couple of times of passing his campsite. And seeing that his car was never moved, I decided that if the car was still there by the next time I drove by, I'd stop to see if he was okay. Thankfully, as it turned out, one of my fellow co-workers had the same thought, and he got there first. He could tell by the smell when he approached the guy's trailer that there was something seriously wrong, and when he went inside. He found the guy with maggots crawling out of where his eyes had been. It was a hot summer, and his body had been there for quite a while before my buddy found him. My buddy guessed it was a heart attack or something, and he reported it to the police, and they dealt with it. But we never heard any more about it. Here are two stories, both take place in the Rocky Mountain region. We don't like to camp in campgrounds because we're antisocial, and none of us care to share a campground with a stranger screaming kids, waving around their flaming hot s'more pokers. When we go camping, we do mild off-road and camp in clearings away from the people. Just after high school, me and my friends decide to celebrate by going out on a camping trip. We ended up leaving way later than we had planned. It was dark by the time we got up into the mountains, and the camping spot was about an hour or so from home. We didn't want to turn around, so we just decided to make due and set up camp in the first decent clearing that we found, and would figure things out in the morning. We all set up our tents in the dark, moonless night, and just went straight to bed. When we woke up. We realized that we had unwittingly set up camp on top of someone's abandoned attempt of a marijuana farm. Not wanting to deal with that shit, we packed up pretty quickly and moved on. The second incident happened a few years later with the same group of friends. We set up camp in a little clearing surrounded by thick trees, and settled around a campfire for the night. After it gets dark. We hear rustling in the trees, and occasionally catch a flash of campfire reflecting off the ice in the distance. We aren't worried. This isn't bear country, and this particular area is covered in deer. We had to stop a few times on the drive to this spot to let deer cross the road, and we noticed tons of hoofprints and deer trails near our camping site whilst we were setting up. We go to bed. And all night long, we hear the snapping of twigs and leaves. They sound like they're coming near the campsite a few times, but then back off when the dog starts barking. The next morning, we notice that there are fresh cougar prints skirting around the edge of our campsite. It's pretty obvious the cougar was circling us all night, sizing us up. We're dumb, young adults, and decided to test our luck, so we stayed a second night. That second night, we decided to take shifts sleeping, with a few of us staying up to watch on guard, with our shotgun ready, and keep our fire tended during the night. Me and my ex had the first half of the night. Occasionally, we would see a yellow flash of eyes for a brief moment, and they disappear again. The dogs would not shut up. 
Maybe it's just paranoia settling in. But my ex swears he saw the cougar off in the trees. At this point, we all decide enough of testing fate and slept in our cars and left next morning. Next morning rolls around and our friend takes the dogs out for a small hike and one last potty break whilst we brewed some coffee. On our way back down the trail, they notice cougar tracks following theirs and we're all convinced we're being stalked. We decide to forget about coffee, tear down camp as quickly as possible and no powder there. An old guiding buddy of mine told me this story. And whilst I wasn't there myself, this happy-go-lucky hyper fella got really pale and quiet telling it. He would only tell it to me during the daytime after weeks of badgering. And it was the only time I saw him scared in all the months we spent leading a group around Appalachia. So, my buddy Mark went camping in a state forest in Virginia with a group of his college friends. They were a small group of four from the outdoor rec department. Experienced kids with all the necessary gear in familiar terrain. Being college kids, however, they rolled into the campsite fairly late and decided to just jump and decided to just car camp, which is camping near the car, no hiking in separate locations. It was early evening, but still just before the sun had set. As they were unloading the car and setting up camp, two mangy fellas came out the woods and approached them. These guys looked like they'd been living out there for quite some time and acted very strangely. They wouldn't look you in the eyes and just really twitched and just seemed really twitchy, just kind of hanging around like they wanted something, like coyotes. My buddy Mark got an uncomfortable feeling right away. The guys introduced themselves. Now, nobody I've spoken to can remember the man's first name. It was something like Bill or Rick. But the second guy said his name was Gizmo. Funny, right? Hard to forget. So Gizmo and his friend began asking questions. Questions like, Are you all going to stay the night? How much food do you have? When are you kids supposed to be heading home? You've all got phones, right? And are there any more of you planning on showing up? Well, Mark didn't like this one bit. So he started telling tales. Yeah, there's going to be eight or ten of us or more showing up tonight. And our parents expect us home first thing tomorrow morning. They're super paranoid. So we got to get home on time or they'll call the cops. Parents, am I right? <laughs> that sort of thing. Gizmo and company poked around camp a bit more then wished the group good luck and disappeared back into the woods. Mark and his friends joked nervously about Gizmo and his friend, but weren't worried enough to actually leave. They built a fire and cooked dinner, then cleaned and hung up the bear bag. They spent the rest of the evening hanging out around the fire, chatting and drinking. One of them had a harmonica, I think. And by midnight, they all turned in and they had brought two tents, a girl's tent and a boy's tent. Well, Mark didn't feel right in the tent. He felt like somebody needed to keep watch. So he slept by the fire. Sometime later, Mark found himself awake. The fire was dying when he opened his eyes and he couldn't see much beyond the campsite, except for one bright burning spot. There was a light out in the woods. It bobbed along at chest height, occasionally disappearing behind the trees sometimes pausing. Whoever it was, was a good distance away, maybe a hundred yards or so, and he followed it for a while until it went out. He stared into the darkness for a long time, until eventually he fell asleep once more. Suddenly Mark woke up again, this time in a panic. The fires were down to embers, barely glowing. He opened his eyes to see the strange light in the forest was back, and much closer now. He could see now, it was from a lantern. He watched as the lantern carved a smooth perimeter around the campsite, occasionally going out, always reappearing a short distance away. Mark pretended to roll on his back in his sleep so that he could watch it. It circled the campsite twice, getting closer each time. The strange thing is, 
There were no sticks breaking, no leaves crunching. Somebody trapezing around the dark woods that that close should have made a lot more noise. Whoever it was was trying to be really quiet. Mark lay there, tense and unmoving. By the time it began its third rotation of the campsite, the lantern was so close that Mark could see a face illuminated on it. It looked like one of the fellas from earlier. He couldn't remember which one. His eyes were bugged out, scanning the campsite like a predator, and he was sweating. And then the lantern went out. At this point, Mark properly woke up. He got up and started making a lot of noise, stoking the fire, packing his gear. His watch read 4.30, and the sun wasn't up yet. He considered all of that happened, and made the tough call to wake his buddy and bug out. Nobody argued when they saw his face. Like I said, this guy is happy-go-lucky, and a human golden retriever, and an experienced woodman to boot. You'd believe him too. The sun was barely starting to come up, and by the time they got in the car, as they were driving out, they passed something that they hadn't noticed on their way in. There was an old RV parked out in the woods, camouflaged with a mixture of earth-coloured tarps and actual greenery. It was surrounded by a chain-link fence that was also draped with camo tarps and leafy broads. The whole thing looked like a long-term hunting campsite. Mark and his friends were actually relieved. Gizmo and his friends must have been poachers, and that would explain their creepy stalking behaviour. They had been trying to scare kids away from their campsite, Scooby-Doo style. Still cautious, they hightailed it out of there, and counted their lucky stars that they weren't deer. That should have been the end of the story. The next part I don't understand. I don't know why Mark or his friends didn't tell anyone about Gizmo for a few weeks. I would have thought for sure he'd report the poachers ASAP. He's very type A, and not typical for him to procrastinate, or let rule go unenforced. I don't know what his excuse was, but Gizmo and his pal were forgotten. Then one day, Mark mentions the incident to a law enforcement officer from the DNR that came to lecture at one of his classes. She asks casual questions, just to be polite, but then stiffens at the mention of the name Gizmo. By any chance do you remember the other guy's name, she asked. No, it was something normal, but I don't remember. God, they always say that, she replied. Turns out that part of this woman's job was investigating the murders that occurred in Virginia State Forests. Most are body dumps for crimes that occurred elsewhere. But over the last decade, a series of unsolved cases, stretching all the way into West Virginia, had targeted what appeared to be random unrelated campers. But when they interviewed other campings in the area around the time of the murders, they all mentioned the same uncanny details. They had all been approached by an individual named Gizmo and another man who nobody's name they can seem to remember.